The views and opinions in this program are not those of CESA 7 or Spectrum. Did you want roll call? Um, yeah, we'll do roll call first. Sandy? Becker? Here. Maloney? Here. McCoy? Um, I think she's coming. Oh. Oh, you know what? She, I bet she's across the hall yet. She's oh. here. Okay, well, she'll be coming. <clears throat> Sit in Kyle? I'm sorry, what I'm... We're doing a roll call. Okay, here. Um, here, sorry. Shelton? Here. Vanden Heuvel? Here. Warren? Here. All right, um, we have six board members present and one more is uh, coming. At this time, I entertain a motion to go into closed session. I move that the board convene in closed session pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 19.85, print 1, print C, considering employment, promotion, compensation, and performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibilities. And pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 19.85, PREN 1, PREN F, concerning financial, medical, social, or personal histories, or disciplinary data of specific persons, preliminary consideration of specific personnel problems, or the investigation of charges against specific persons except where PAR PREN B, applies which, if discussed in public, would likely to have a substantial adverse effect upon the reputation of any person referred to in such histories or data, or involved in such problems or investigations to wit, staff investigations, pending employee resignation, and administrative hiring, and pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 19.85, PREN 1, PREN G, conferring with legal counsel for the governmental body who is rendering oral or written advice concerning strategy to be adopted by the body with respect to litigation, in which it is or likely to become to wit potential litigation. The board will reconvene in open session at 6 p.m. pursuant to a section 19.85, print 2, Wisconsin statute to consider the balance of the agenda, which will include an open forum, system and monitoring reports, and the superintendent's update. Is there a second? Second. Sandy? <coughs> Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. Bannon Hubel? Aye. Sitnikow? Aye. Becker? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Carried 7 0. We'll convene across the hall. We don't need this. No. I move that the board reconvene in open session pursuant to section. 19.85 paren 2 Wisconsin statutes to consider the balance of the agenda. Is there a second? Second. Second. Sandy? Oh, I this part. You can hand this to Sandy for that place. Thank you. Maloney? She's there. Just pass. McCoy? Here. Oh, aye. Shelton? Aye. Becker? Aye. Sitnikow? She's not here oh. temporarily. Warren? Aye. Vanden Heuvel? Aye. Carried five aye. and two absents. Oh, carried six aye. with one absent. Um, all right, next, uh, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America 
and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Eric, if you could please read the mission statement. Sure. We educate all students to be college career and community ready, inspired to succeed in our diverse world. Thank you. The next is uh, the reading of our collaborative commitments. This is uh, something the board developed and adopted on September 24th of this year. We'll start at this end. We started at the other end last time. Um, each of us will read one of the commitments. We will strive to review board materials and seek clarifying information before board meetings. We will embrace diverse views and perspectives as a path to effective solutions. We will show consideration to everyone, fellow school board members, staff, students, families, and community members in our speech and behavior. We will consider the merits of ideas as the primary driver of our decisions. We will offer our comments efficiently and succinctly and avoid repetition in order to keep board meetings to a reasonable length. We will create equitable and inclusive opportunities to promote community engagement. We will engage in conversations in a way that allow for all perspectives to be shared, considered, and valued. Great, right, thank you. And next we have some recognitions uh, to give out. We have a number of guests here this evening. Um, this is the 2019 WASB, which is the Wisconsin Association of School Boards Business Honor Roll. And these are going to our uh, some of our business partners and in appreciation for uh, all of the hard work and, and all of the things that we've been able to do because of your partnerships. And there's a, many varied uh, aspects of these partnerships. Um, I won't go into all of those details, but at this time, I think the best thing to do is just call up each team separately because I know we have a number of people on um, each of the team, well, some of them are here by themselves, others have a team, but I'll just call up the Bridges Construction and Renovation Advisory Team. And the, um, we're gonna take your picture, so if you wanna uh, spread out behind me here. Um, the, the plaque says it's the 2019 WASB Business Honor Roll. The Wisconsin Association of School Boards and Green Bay Area School District recognizes Bridges Construction and Renovation Advisory Team for supporting our local public schools and students. September 2019, signed Brenda Warren, Board President, and John Ashley, who's the WASB Executive Director. And our Bridges program is um, helps our students learn how to build homes essentially they've given they've provided us with support we've been able to offer opportunities to our students to go out into the community and um, essentially build a home alongside contractors and and other um, skilled uh, skilled workers in the uh, in trades so um, I thank them for all of their hard work You can see some of the beautiful homes they've built together with our students on Broadway. And I don't know where your next one is coming, but um, we look forward to all those open houses and invite the community when they are open. So. Um, next is Broadway Automotive, and I think Casey uh, Keen, is that who's coming David, forward? David, da David, David Keen. Keen, sorry. We have uh, actually um, look at this, three car teams that um, are coming forward. We've had a number of partnerships with our um, automobile dealerships and um, uh, also with the National Ford 
um, company and helping us with our city stadium automotive, which is a program at East High School that gives our students real life experience with repairing cars in a, in a um, top of the line car repair facility. And the facility is, is uh, in thanks to our um, many of our dealerships that have come forward. We've also had a um, partnership with um, Dorsch Ford Kia, who's um, Dorsch Ford Lincoln Kia, who's um, helped with our, um, our special education program with detailing cars that was highly successful. Um, and uh, anyway, this is um, David Keene from Broadway Automotive, and he's been a really uh, um, a leader in helping us establish the City Stadium Automotive Program and helping encourage our students and hire our students and um, um, all sorts of things like that. So thank you to him. And thank you. Oh, we got the plaque. We do, but we got to take it down because it's upside down. <laughs> Oh, I got gotcha. you. The local's supposed to be in the top, so Lori will get it back to you. Next is the um, team from Dorsch Ford Lincoln Kia. And again, I uh, we thank them for. <laughs> And then um, we have a representative from the Ford, the Ford Motor Company. Oh, and I forgot. And Ford Motor Company actually donated a car to the City Stadium Automotive Program. I forgot and a motor. I forgot what kind of car it was. Ford. Focus. <laughs> Probably a Ford, a Ford Focus. So it was uh, great for the students to have a car that's it's a, a fairly new car for them to work on and learn about, um, learn learn through that experience. So thank you for you that. Yes, they have given us a great amount of support. Oh, okay, go ahead. I just, um, for the community who may not know a great deal about um, City Stadium Automotive, um, these are folks that have been with us pretty much from day one. Uh, Lori Peacock and the team went out and had the vision um, and to bring com competitors to the table. Um, has been a really extraordinary experience. If you go there, you see a top-notch, world-class um, automotive job shop that affords our students um, extraordinary opportunities. And this year, um, we were able to graduate uh, students who walked across the stage at NWTC first, the technical college, with their certifications before they even graduated from high school. I know that we also have some employed right in the field. Um, it's an extraordinary experience, and we couldn't do it without you. And to have the, the Ford Motor Company be um, involved very closely with us is really icing on the cake as well. So we really appreciate all that you do and also I, I don't want to to um, let it go also that the bridges construction has provided our kids extraordinary opportunities it has been in a journey and 
working collectively with all of you. We feel so fortunate. And more importantly, all you have to do is talk to the students who are growing exponentially every time you see them from the beginning when they start the process and work with you and continue on. They are professional. They are right at the top of their game because of all of you investing in them. So we greatly appreciate that as well. Thank you. OK. And finally, um, we have the Northeast Wisconsin Manufacturing Alliance. I think this partnership has been our longest. Um, when did we start? And long time. Um, we've been working with them for a long time, and that they've helped us uh, set up our Baylink manufacturing program, and that's at West High School. It gives kids, students, the opportunity to have a real um, job-like opportunities. They do real projects for businesses. They do sales calls and set up contracts and and uh, determine pricing and when the product will be due and things like that. And I know the people from the Manufacturing Alliance have been a part of that all along in terms of providing in-kind donations, uh, cash money um, to help us with the machinery, and then also just coming and helping with uh, be with our students and help educate them on, on what the manufacturing world is like outside of high school. So we thank you, Anne, for that. And how many manufacturers? How many manufacturers are collaborative as part of the as part of we have NUMA? About 180 different manufacturers. Wow. That are 180 manufacturers, and again, this is what collaboration can look like in support of our kids. So we're very grateful. I also want to say I've been attending the Bridges um, advisory team meetings, and I know that as part of, of that work, um, the construction um, companies have, have come together to, to create something that's very similar to the Northeast Wisconsin Manufacturing Alliance, and that's still in its early stages, but I think something that is, is not always easy to do, to bring together people that in the outside world are sometimes com uh, direct competitors, but but uh, I really appreciate the fact that, that those um, two, two businesses have, have seen the importance for our students and for, for um, their viability in terms of having people that are trained in the, in the work that needs to be done. Um, so that's, that's uh, to me, it's really exciting to see all of the collaboration that has come of these partnerships. So thank you to everybody again. All right. Um, Let's see. We have, we're going to get to our open forum, but before we do that, um, I'd like to remind the public that you can view the board agenda and handouts as well as minutes from past meetings by visiting the district website at www.gbaps.org. Click on our district, that's at the top. Yes, thank you. Don't feel you need to stay for our meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs> Enjoy your evening. <laughs> Click on our district at the top, and then on the left, you'll see where it says Board of Education. On the left menu there, you'll find a link to agendas and minutes. This link will take you to a website called Agenda Manager, where all board agendas, minutes, and handouts from board meetings are housed. I'd also like to remind board members that um, I've been told that there's that it's sometimes difficult to hear in the back of the room when the vending machine goes on and the, the heating goes on. So if board members can just, um, or anybody with a microphone, can make sure to speak um, directly into the microphone so everyone can hear and so we get a good recording. Hang on, I got to, can you run? Oh, there you go, thanks. Karen, do you want to clarify then how you want the folks back there to let you know if they can't hear? Um, yeah, I mean, I think if you just raise your hand, one of us will probably see you. Um, just this kind of hand waving. So if anyone at the board table sees that someone's having trouble hearing, just um, if I haven't seen it, just bring it to my attention and we'll remind everyone again to, to speak um, into the microphone. All right. <clears throat> 
The board will go, uh, next will be at our open forum. The board will provide our community with two different opportunities during, during tonight's meeting to speak before the for, speak before the board. The first opportunity is during our open forum. The second opportunity will be during agenda items where indicated by public comment on our agenda. All speakers must fill out a form indicating their desire to speak. If you wish to speak during tonight's open forum, you may do so with respect to items that are posted on tonight's agenda or any other matter you wish to share with the board. Please know that Wisconsin's open meetings law prohibits the board from conducting business on matters brought during this open forum. The board also will permit public comment during agenda items as noted on the board's agenda. During this public participation time, consistent with state and federal laws, board members may engage in dialogue with the speakers. In order that all voices are heard, the board will suspend engagement until all speakers have had a chance to speak. The process for speaking during, our, during the agenda items is as follows. follows. The board will first hear the presentation and discuss the agenda item before calling on those who desire to speak. If you want to speak during a specific agenda item, please fill out a form and give it to the board secretary at any point during the meeting. If you desire to speak and haven't yet filled out a form, just indicate that to the board secretary and you can fill out a form afterwards. The board secretary will provide the names of those wishing to speak to the board member conducting that part of the meeting and you will be called upon to speak at the appropriate time. Please keep your comments to five minutes. Prior to starting your comments, please provide your name and address. Um, I'd also like to, we took roll call before we went into closed session at five o'clock, but I'd also like to, and all seven board members are present. Um, our board secretary, Sandy Heller, is at the end of the table. To my left is Dr. Michelle Langenfeld, our superintendent. And we have two intercity student council members. Um, I know Luke is going to be a little late, Luke Pisani. He's the president of intercity student council and he's from um, Southwest High School. And then also Brandon Freiberg, who's also from Southwest High School. Welcome, Brandon. Um, all right, so at this point I have one person who's filled out a form indicating a desire to speak, and that's Casey Steinbrink. You can, yeah, that's fine. Has to speak or is it on the middle button is the face, the profile of the face. There it is. <clears throat> Thanks for your time. I attached, um, some notes on my comments, I think it's probably twice as long as the five minutes I have, so I'm going to go off script and just kind of uh, give you guys some really big picture thoughts. And it was suggested by one of my son's teacher that I come in and speak at a school board meeting. Um, so my name is Casey Steinberg, and I live at 534 Edelweiss Drive in the east side of Green Bay. Right now I have two sons who are attending uh, Martin Elementary. Before that, they uh, participated in the Oak Learning Center uh, nature-based program at the Wildlife Sanctuary, which was an amazing program. Um, it was a great jump start for them, and they had a, an amazing time. And I'm really happy to hear that that's a program that's expanding. Um, but unfortunately, and kind of the reason I'm here is that something I noticed happening with my kids after they left that program is they started to lose that, you know, sense of curiosity and excitement that, that, they, that they had about learning at that time. And I know we, there were programs with UWGB measuring success of kids who came out of those programs and things like that. And I was just so impressed with that program and the kind of learning that happened that I wondered why we don't have more of that. Um, in the traditional school setting system. So um, I want to also say that uh, I had two grandmothers who were teachers in the Green Bay Public School System. My mom also taught in the Green Bay Public School System. So I have a lot of respect for teachers and all their hard work and commitment. But I've also noticed, especially through going to through parent-teacher conferences, that teachers are stressed out and frustrated with some of the ways that they have to teach kids right now. Um, a lot of it has to do around the, the standardized assessments, which I'm sure you guys have heard plenty of complaints about in the past, and I'm not here to tell you what I think is wrong about them at all. Instead, I'd like to just kind of talk about, tell you a few stories about good things that have happened and three things that I would love to see more of potentially considered be brought into the Green Bay Public School System. And some of it you were even talking about today during your recognitions, and that's project-based learning, student-led learning, and physical activity. So 
uh, project-based learning, I think, is really important because it gets kids thinking creatively and outside of the box, gets them working collaboratively, brings out leadership skills and things like that. So a great story to tell you is Miss Kaiser, my oldest son's teacher, who's in, he's in fourth grade, she had a unit this uh, early this school year where kids were putting together electrical circuits, trying to figure it out on their own, right? And my son was, first time he came home, really excited about school in a while, saying he was the second kid to figure it out. But the kid who figured it out first did it differently than him. It was, it was a different method. And he told me, well, that's because there are different ways of solving the same problem, Dad. So when I told Mrs. Kaiser that, Ms. Kaiser that, she beamed because it was like, that's what she wants to hear about kids learning. But most of our parent-teacher conference is spent talking about how he's doing on these assessments. And that's fine, because he's doing fine. My other kid, uh, my middle son, his teacher expressed some concerns about him not being able to focus in class, not listening to instructions. He's not a troublemaker. He gets in trouble every now and then. One time he stuck a paper clip in an outlet in the computer lab to see what happens. Nothing good happens, he found out. And, but she worried, was worried a little bit about his math specifically. He had struggled in reading in the past, but now he's doing great in reading. So, and we were surprised to hear that, my wife and I, because he came home telling us that he loved math, that it was his favorite, and he's asking us to give us multiplication problems to figure out in his head all the time. Well, the reason he loves math is because Mrs. Johnson, his teacher, makes it a game when she's teaching it. But when he has to take that assessment, it's just another worksheet to him, so he doesn't care. He's not really trying. So, I mean, it is what it is, but I'm hearing one thing about what my kid thinks about math and seeing another thing on the worksheet that he probably didn't care about and didn't show his work and all that sort of things. So that's a, and he also has gotten in trouble, a little bit of trouble at recess because he is roughhousing with his friends. Nothing real serious, but he was made to stand up against the wall and couldn't participate in recess. So um, uh, we got a write-up sent home to us and uh, was told that he snuck back to play. And we wonder, you know, well, sometimes, and I'm sure teachers would agree with this, that um, little physical activity and getting some exercise can help kids focus. And I know they believe that at Martin because there's a storage closet in Martin with a treadmill and a trampoline in it. Where, and I saw this when I was standing in line for school pictures. My oldest son told me that's what the kids call the crazy room, where kids get sent when they're, being mis when they're misbehaving to run on the tram treadmill or trampoline to burn some steam. But it would seem to me that if we could give them that opportunity before it becomes a problem and they need to get sent to a storage room to run on a treadmill, that that might be a helpful thing. So I would love to see a little more of that in school too. And finally, the last thing, student-led learning, where kids can explore things that they're interested in and do things on their own creatively. You know, we've all walked through elementary schools and seen art projects hanging on the wall. They're cool, they're cute, but they're also a wall of sameness. So even art class is, is teaching kids to all do the same projects pretty much the same way, instead of telling kids, you know, experiment with this, see what you come up with. And I don't want to fault any teachers or any process, but I think there are a lot of ways that we can improve the traditional education system in Green Bay. Now, I have a nephew and a niece who go to Da Vinci, and they were also in the Oak Learning Program. And so, and I know from, da, from what their experience is that there is that kind of learning going on at Da Vinci, more student-led learning, more project-based stuff, um, more kids of different ages working together on things. And I know that that's not totally absent from schools like Martin, but I would love to see more of that be implemented. And um, I guess, I know you guys can't comment on it now because it's not part of the agenda, but you have my contact information, and I'm willing to find out more about how I can get involved, and I hope that as you get, make decisions about uh, education in this city that you'll think about those sorts of things. I know that you are because I hear about the things that you were recognizing people for today. But it would be great if th that that was not just something that we patted our backs on for and handed out plaques for, but it became something that was part of our everyday educational process. You know, I think that it's great 
that a school like Da Vinci is there for kids, but there's probably a lot of untapped potential and unknown potential in kids whose parents don't have prepare them for that test that they need to take to get into Da Vinci, right? So I think those kids deserve that kind of educational experience too, because I think that's the kind of educational experience that's going to prepare them for uh, the future of work. It's an uncertain future right now, and you know I'm not asking for more technology in the classroom because by the time these kids are in the workforce, technology will be changed. But what we can do is teach them how to think and teach them how to have empathy and give them confidence and teach them to think creatively. Those are skills that they'll be able to use no matter what kind of world um, we move into. So thank you. Rhonda? Um, I appreciate your, your, your words, your thoughts, your statement today. Um, so just so you know, we have a school board election coming up in April. I don't know if you knew that or not. I know elections are in April. <laughs> I know there would probably be school board ones since they're usually, yes. Just throwing it out there. I think I got the hint. <laughs> and Thank then, you. Uh, Casey, and thanks for uh, providing the written. Sandy will make copies for all of us. And then is your contact information on that yes. too? Good. Okay. Thanks. Okay, um, is there anyone else who would like to speak before the board? Seeing none, then we'll move to our minutes. I'd entertain a motion under minutes. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Next is monitoring reports, and that will be facilitated by Laura McCoy. Okay, we're going to be hearing from John Magus, and we're going to be talking about school success planning um, and uh, progress monitoring report. Hi, John. Hello, and thanks for having me. And this work represents the work of, of many people on, on various teams, both in uh, the departments that I supervise as well as uh, the work that, that um, Vicki Beyer does within student services and uh, other areas as well. So our, um, our presentation focuses on, oh, looks like we're ahead a few slides somehow. Not sure what happened there. Sorry, great. So our objectives for today are that we'll be focusing on basically expanding our under, the working with the board to expand the understanding of how the leadership team is operationalizing the board's mission, vision, and core values, as well as our strategic directions. Uh, we'll also clarify the objectives for our three board progress monitoring uh, reports on school success planning that will occur throughout the year, as well as deepen our understanding on how through line accountability improves student achievement by aligning district resources to best support and empower schools. And we're, we're keeping the presentation re relatively brief, but there are, because of, um, I'm not refreshing with all the context of the, the various other presentations, there's, there's a slide or two that might look familiar, but for the most part, if there's additional information that you'd like, I'd be glad to share it. And it's in our, our previous documents on school success planning. So, uh, as I mentioned, we, we will be having three, um, three progress monitoring reports this year. One is split into two. The first one is this month, which is school success plans, talking about our alignment of support. Uh, we'll have two mid-year reports, splitting our, our uh, focus areas of academic excellence and personalized pathways for our February report, as well as our March report on engagement and thriving workforce. And then finally, we'll follow up in June with our school success plans, uh, looking at uh, reporting out on how things went, as well as next steps. And this is, this is one of the, the repeat slides, not, not uh, many that we have, but basically we, we wanted to discuss a little bit about the through line of accountability, that this is about the efforts that come up from the classroom based on work that teachers do with, with their students, based on the work that a principal does with the teacher, and how we're supporting that principal in the work that they do as a district. The through line also runs the opposite direction, where if there are things that we're trying to accomplish as, a, as an entire district, or if there's a direction of the district or, or direction that the board has set for us, it allows us as a, as a district uh, to support 
the individual principals and individual schools as they work with teachers to ensure uh, great results. And then you see the it's, a, it's all about the alignment of our arrows. If we're all facing different directions, doing different things with different objectives, it, it doesn't uh, help us reach our goal. But when we have our, our efforts aligned and congruent and coherent, it makes a lot more sense and we're able to reach our goals. And a lot of the work that we do is really focused on the work that's done between the executive director and the principal. That's, that's the nexus between the district office and the work being done in schools. And there's a quote there from the Wallace Foundation. Uh, it says, leadership is second only to classroom instruction among all school-related factors that contribute to what students learn at school. So really it's the principal and how can we best pr uh, support the principal? How can we align for support and empowerment of our schools? And that's, that's work, uh, there's a link there on Leadership Matters. It's work with the Wallace Foundation as well as the National Associations for Secondary and Elementary Principals. And we are partnering actually now with the Wallace Foundation related to a principal pipeline project that they asked us to participate in that focuses on sustainability of leadership as well as uh, making sure that there are career ladder opportunities for teachers and others who are interested in, in leadership opportunities, not just principalship, but looking at curriculum work and other areas as well. So we'll be sharing more on that as, as time comes, but we're honored to be part of that Wallace Foundation work. We also have been part of uh, work being done by the Wallace Foundation related to principal supervision and making sure that our work around how we supervise our principals is based on, on uh, best practice research around making sure that it's as supportive as possible, but we're also helping um, make sure that the accountability is there. So if we say we're going to do something all together on paper, that it actually is occurring in, in uh, the schools and in the classrooms. There's great intention and a lot of hard work being done by, by uh, everyone involved, but it's, it's really phenomenal work. So what does this look like in Green Bay? And we've come uh, before you before, and we've talked about through a variety of research uh, areas, we've, we've identified three areas of instructional leadership that will, are vital to student achievement. And those three areas are professional learning and growth focused to maximize student achievement, high performing teams using data to maximize achievement, and performance evaluation and feedback mo focused on, on student achievement. You might say, boy, those sound kind of, you know, kind of basic in some ways, but it's, it's the depth to which we go with that work to make sure that it's really occurring um, in depth in every school. For example, our, our, uh, our learning teams, it, it, our, our uh, PLCs or our CL, CLTs that are focused on departmental work at our secondaries or grade level work at our elementaries, they meet on a weekly basis and go deep into the student data looking at who did well and what can they do to, uh, to make sure that they are uh, creating engaging opportunities and hands-on learning and things, things that we talked about to make sure that the students are, are, are growing. Now those assessments that we talk about aren't necessarily deep time consuming thing. It could be an activity that, that, it, that takes place, maybe a, a project that a student produces or other things that are, that are used to assess learning that they use during that time. So really it's about distilling down what the principles and we feel are most essential projects and most essential work of, this, of the school and making sure that it's done well. How do we do that? Well, uh, there, there's the guide to continuous improvement, which we shared with you uh, previously at a retreat that, that outlines what our school success planning process looks like. Uh, we also have our school success planning retreats, which are generally in the summer, and we're working to make sure that those are early enough so that we are aligning our district plans based on what the schools are doing, as opposed to just telling the schools what we think should be done. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, we have monthly collaboration with individual principals. And this is really, in many ways, where the magic happens, where uh, an executive director is working with the principal and taking time to maybe do a learning walk with the principal or observe some professional uh, learning that's taking place with staff or running, watching the principal run a staff meeting and then giving feedback. Because the, having been a principal and, and others, others have been in that role as well, it can be lonely work because you, um, it's not lonely from a perspective of working with kids, but as far as the feedback that you get, you don't often get 
uh, an objective set of eyes that, that comes with, with constructive feedback on what did you do well and what might you do differently, as well as how can we support you in doing so. We also have monthly all principal meetings, which uh, are, are with all of our principals from 4K through our high schools. And this year we've, we've changed the structure a bit so that we're uh, allocating a fair amount of time for quadrant work, which we haven't had time in, in recent years where we've done a uh, lateral alignment so that the feeder schools from the elementary are meeting with the middle school and the middle school is meeting with the high school all together focused on work that needs to be done as, as a district or area. And when we've talked about that in front of the board before, we talked about it, how it's like a river. And if we're focusing on a school, that's like a segment of the river. But we really have to think about the, the health and support of that whole uh, structure from, from 4K through graduation and beyond if we're really going to have impact on uh, student achievement with depth. We also have monthly leveled principal meetings. So tomorrow morning, for example, our secondary schools, our, uh, our secondary principals are meeting at, uh, at Southwest High School, and they go more deeply into things that affect just their, uh, their area. So those are, are things that we're focusing on, making sure that we're going into with depth. And the observations and feedback, what I mentioned, an observation might be something like I mentioned where the principal supervisor is out doing a learning walk or observing a principal during a staff meeting. But then I'm also working with our principal supervisors where I will be doing the same for them. So I'm accompanying them and giving them feedback on, on their work as principal supervisors. That is something that there isn't a lot of deep training throughout the, the, the country. We've engaged in some here in Green Bay, and I think we've been lucky to partner again with the Wallace Foundation and others for that work, but it's different supervising and leading and coaching leadership as it is uh, coaching um, classroom teachers. There are many similarities, but there are some differences, and that's where we, we work to uh, become tightly aligned. So what does that work look like? Just, just a couple things here. We talked about, the, again, the work between the executive director and principal related to school success planning. So this, each school produces a school success plan, and those school success plans are o also interwoven with the work if they are ESSA identified, so that it's not, it's not uh, duplicative. It's, it's one uh, school success plan that meets both objectives. But what we do with that work is we make sure that, that we're following a process rubric. So we're looking at uh, an assessment being done between the principal and their team as well as the principal supervisor looking at that plan. So three times a year, the principal works with their leadership team to look at their plan and say, how are we doing with the things that we said we would do? And if you think about it as like, you know, New Year's Eve uh, uh, commitments that we might wake, make, if you write it on, down on paper rather than just think it, you're, you probably have a greater likelihood of, of doing it. But if you revisit that mission and what you're going to do, there's far greater chance. Uh, that you're going to follow through. But what this really comes down to is is tracking explicitly what are the what's the next step that you need to do to actualize your plan and then we make sure that we follow up with support and just check in to make sure that that occurs. Uh, we also talked about making sure that we have a, a clearer dashboard for our data. So working with um, we have a data visualization tool uh, EduClimber that we're, we're implementing and working with so that the data can be better used uh, right now, we have um, a lot of hand tallying of different reports and things like that, where this will be instantaneous ability to uh, look at data and look at uh, a various number of, of um, looking at various uh, multiple variables within the same report and being able to access that. So as a teacher, if I'm looking at my Latino student population and I want to know how are they doing in math, but also how are the kids doing in math that might be struggling with attendance, I can pull those variables together and look at that so that I have, uh, I can test hypotheses and think about what my next steps are in, in serving students well. We also talk about uh, the work we're doing with our own professional learning around school success planning to make sure our, our process is uh, not onerous, that it's relatively easy, but it's worthwhile for everybody involved. Then this is something that we started this year. Uh, it's, it's relatively new. Uh, we, we always did it to some degree, but it's been formalized. And that's uh, districts, uh, district department support of success planning. And of course, we always look to serve our schools, 
But what we did this year is we, we took a look at the themes that we had within our school success plans and each of our executive directors reviewed their school success plan to look at what themes emerged as far as what did the various schools say that they were going to work on so that then we as departments could think about, boy, if this is the school that, if this is what the schools are asking for and we're the departments that serve those schools and they're our customers, what should our planning look like to make sure that we're serving the customer needs as, as a department? Um, so, so again, that work is, is um, moving into its second phase, which really will be thinking about as we go into the budgeting cycle and as we go into the staffing cycle, if there are things that are specifically called out that need more support or maybe not, not called out that might not need as much support, we wanna make sure that we're allocating our resources uh, based at least partially on those themes that emerge. And then in the coming year, as the principals put together their, their school success plans, our summer retreat will be focusing on rather than having departments start their plan without knowing what schools are asking for, we'll actually be taking a deeper look at those themes and looking at what, what our customers, the schools are asking for so that our supports are aligned for empowering those schools. So that's, that's been uh, really productive and worthwhile work. Uh, the, and would you mind clicking on the, the link there for just a second? So this is a link with our school success uh, plan patterns. And basically it's split into those three leadership areas and it outlines what are the things that we uh, observed within our school success plans. If the, I wanna make sure the link is open to everybody, I think it is. But basically it, it outlines the various um, aspects and themes that our schools are working on related to professional development, related to their teams working with data, and related to giving feedback to their, their staff. So that's something you can look at to, to go into further if you'd like. If you could go back to the presentation, that'd be great. So our next steps, again, are to continue to refine that continuous improvement calendar that we have, uh, to refine the process based on the input that we're receiving from our principals and others. Uh, also to uh, continue our work related to school supervision and principal supervision, as well as the leadership aspects that we talked about, making sure that we have sustainability of our, our principalships when, when we have an opening, that we have a cadre of people who are well-trained and ready to go, and that we have a system to track who is in what spot as far as their readiness. We also will work to improve our allocation of resources and allocation of uh, staff, as well as the department uh, plans based on school needs and continue to support leadership that leads to positive school outcomes. And speaking of positive school outcomes, there's, I, I'm not gonna steal the thunder, but there, there is a nice positive outcome that will be part of the uh, superintendent's um, report, as well as the reports that we do next month with, with monitoring related to our state report cards. So I'll leave you hanging with that suspense, but if you have any questions, let me know. I have a question, Don, if you, um... Can you elaborate a little bit more on why it's so important to um, offer coaching to principals? Sure. Sure, I, th I, I believe that it's important to offer coaching to principals uh, for a variety of reasons. One being that the work is complex and the work is important. As we said, the research shows that, that the principal is the second most important person in the district. The teacher is the most important but a highly effective principal can shape and improve the instruction of many teachers if, if they're supporting those teachers well. So we wanna make sure that they're as highly skilled in their craft as can be. And as we know, I mean, just thinking about Green Bay, where we, we look at who, who's here in Green Bay, the Green Bay Packers, and, and do they have coaches who work with them specifically on making sure that they're the best they can be in certain areas? Of course. It's not saying that our principals aren't good by any means. We have a great, great, uh, principal team, but all of us are always looking for ways that we can get even better and making sure that we have skilled uh, principal supervision that can provide not just not just summary judgment based on, on kind of knowing what's going on, but in-depth understanding of what's happening in a school and um, worthwhile guidance as far as being a thinking partner with the principal, and then also if the if a principal is stuck with something, being able to offer here are a variety of, of opportunities or, or, or things that 
others have done or they might have done in their own principalship that could be something that brings them forward, it really uh, does offer an opportunity to make sure that our principals are their best. And there is quite a bit of research as well. I can link it with the Wallace Foundation research that, that uh, proper principal supervision also has a dramatic effect on student performance. So would you say that even um, your really um, um, skilled principals and principals have been with our district for a long time still um, welcome coaching and uh, professional development? I believe they do. I think it, it depends to some degree on where they are in their journey. But I, to be honest, I think that the, the people who are um, sometimes even the best at their game are the ones that are most thirsty for the, the knowledge and information. Um, I think that, that quite often people who are good at what they do, basically they, they receive kind of relatively hollow accolades sometimes. Great job. You do really well but they're not really told what is it that they do really well that they could do more of, or even though they're doing 10 things really well, what are the two things that are pretty good that they could take to the next level? And so I think that, that uh, even, our, even our best leaders are uh, interested in that feedback and appreciative of the feedback. They've also, uh, we, we've had a number of opportunities where we've gone really deep with the coaching and had a very significant impact on, on uh, the performance of, of the school, as well as the, the relationship between the coach and the principal, as well as the, um, the impact on how the teachers felt within that school and the uh, results from an academic standpoint. Thank you. Eric? Thanks for sharing this, John. Uh, really great information. I, um, obviously, I think leadership is incredibly important, and I didn't realize that we had all of these structures in place to, to support our administrators. Um, a couple of questions. Um, would you be able to give me just sort of your estimation of um, where, where, who are our principals? Or would you say that a majority of them have been in our district or been a lot of experience? Do we have a lot of new or is it kind of a little bit of everything? What would kind of be your, not looking for the hard data, but just sort of your impression on that? Sure. I would say we have a, a pretty broad range. And I, I would say that in administration in general throughout the state of Wisconsin, I'd say with, uh, Apple, or, um, Green Bay is, is also pretty pretty similar, that our, our uh, and I don't mean this as any disrespect, getting, getting a little uh, more experienced myself. We have, have a number of principals that are in, in the more experienced range, but we also have some newcomers that are, that are really doing exceptionally well as, as well, that are... Um, stepping into positions as, as new, uh, bold champions of, of um, equity and, and uh, success for our students. So it's a variety. But what we want to do is we want to make sure that everybody is supported and empowered at their level to be their best. For example, we have people who are going into admin programming and finish their, their um, administrative certification, and they're not really sure necessarily how to connect with the school to offer those services and kind of up their game. And if we don't do that, if we don't provide the, the hand and support to do that, what occurs is, is they, they might not be able to practice those skills. And then when they get into an interview, they can say, hey, I've got the certification. But the question comes down to what have you done in your school to change instruction or what have you done to help a team change behavior or things like that? And they don't necessarily have that opportunity. By the same token, the assistant principals and sometimes the administrative interns, they're, they're incredibly hard working, but they're put into a situation where maybe most of their work is spent dealing with student behavior or discipline, which is vitally important. But we also want to make sure that they're practicing uh, and having access to practice uh, some of those instructional leadership skills that will give them opportunity and edge for, for considering what would be the next step if they were interested. One more question. Um, one of the uh, things that I struggled with as a young administrator was um, that work-life balance. I'm wondering if there's anything specifically, um, especially with, with new administrators, to help from the, the job kind of consuming your life and, and making sure that you're healthy both, uh, you know, personally. I, I think it, it comes down to... Um realizing that, that change will take time, that we'll be there to, to support you and that we'll be there to, to help with that support. I think sometimes when people go into administration in the beginning, they are uh, feeling like and want to be able to change the, the world in a day. And it's not that we don't have a sense of urgency, 
but we also have to realize sometimes that it's that it's a marathon it's not a sprint that there are things that we can uh, that, that we need to change as quickly as possible but we also have to realize that if you're working 20 hours a day or or, or long you know basically you could work 24 hours a day that you're going to burn yourself out and that you need to take a little bit of time for self-care you have to make sure that you're establishing some some boundaries you know maybe it's a set period of time on the weekend that, that you're wanting calls unless it's a uh, serious emergency or uh, that you're generally re responding to emails until a set period of time at night but then if it's not an emergency you'll, you might uh, come back to it in the morning so helping guide people from that regard as well as um, I think people feel less stressed when they feel that they have the skills to be successful and that comes back to your question about coaching if you are in a situation where you don't feel like you're being successful and you're not sure what to do. Pe the people who are principals, as you know, are very committed to doing what's best for their kids. And if they're put in that situation where they feel that stress and they don't know what to do about it, it can be uh, challenging. So we want to make sure that we're connecting with, with supporting people on what are the next steps as far as the support. And really, when we looked at our, our um, departments, thinking about how can we again align those departments so that they're providing those skills so the principal isn't left feeling that angst without having uh, resources uh, deeply connected. Thank you. Sure. Else? Michelle? I just want to um, thank you, John, and uh, the, all the team. You've been working very hard to put systems in place. And this has been a hard journey and a long journey, which I think better supports though what's going on in our schools. The difference between what in our, our uh, system and continuous improvement where we were a number of years ago and now really focused on the universal and being able to have structures and systems in place, a tiered system meeting the needs of kids is really I think one of the key key things that um, has really started to to um, move that bamboo tree growing so to speak. So I appreciate that. You know, as, and the other piece, I just want to share that um, part of our part of our work and part of our discussion, um, as you talk about work-life balance, right now education is in an interesting spot. Um, the gentleman who spoke so beautifully earlier talks about the importance of of raising children and affording them addressing that whole child in, in the process. So we, we, we look at social emotional development as part of the MLSS system, but we also have that pressure of always needing to, to continuously improve, but sometimes the driver is not what a teacher in a classroom would see as best. Sometimes it's coming, you know, but we have that balance. And I think that's that um, it re will require, I think, um, the board and administration and teachers to really get underneath that and decide um, it's the collective piece of what people expect um, that really has to start to drive forward. So if, if the work-life balance is, if the principal believes that the coach or the support person at central office wants them on, on point 24 seven, they're gonna respond that way because they wanna do a really good job. Um, and so it's really, it's really looking at that whole picture. So I'm, I'm thinking we need more conversation around this, but a big shout out to all of the team and the teachers and the, and the principals and everybody moving this because this is a system. It is a continuous improvement system with equity at the center and it's moving and it's working. So shout out to Vicki as well. Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to thank you all for that. So anybody else? Thank you, John. Thank you to your Thanks, team. John. Thanks, John. Thank you for the time and I appreciate the uh, guidance. Um, next is superintendent's update and that'll be um, I'll turn that over to Dr. Langenfeld. Thank you, Dr. Warren. I'm going to start with the calendar. Um, we are moving into the month of December. We have a special board meeting at 5 o'clock right here in this room, um, 331 down on Broadway. And uh, we have the teaching and learning work session immediately following at 6 o'clock um, in the same room. On December 2nd, we also have the organizational support work session immediately following. 
December 16th is our regular board meeting at 6 o'clock beginning, and December 17th, our ICSC mm -hmm. meeting, um, which is mm -hmm. our student leadership meeting from the district with the board at 7.30 a.m. and the next that day on the 17th. And then we have winter recess from the 21st of December through January 1st. Classes resume January 2nd, 2020. So that's the calendar upcoming. Um, and as we move forward at this time, I have the next item, which is text steps update. This is a really exciting grant program and I'm gonna invite Laura Simmering, a counselor from East High School who has been on point for this wonderful program as we prepare our students and make sure their journey and pathway to college is, is well supported on the way, even in the summer. So welcome, Laura. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Yes. I good? Yes. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and chat with you all today. I bring really good news to you. Um, like Dr. Langenfeld said, my name is Laura Simmering, and I am a school counselor at East. Um, and I'm also going to throw out there that I'm a proud West High graduate <laughs> as well. <laughs> so um, just to give you all a background on Tech Steps. So this was a grant project that was given to the Green Bay Public School District via Ascendium Education Group. And Ascendium focuses on and funds um, organizations and districts that have a large population of students who are first generation college students, um, low income and minority. Um, and we were one of 15 districts chosen in the state of Wisconsin to participate in this two year grant. Um, and the basis of it is Ascendium has done a lot of research on students who um, graduate from high school in May or June with college acceptance letters in hand, but then for a variety of reasons, they don't end up matriculating onto college in the fall. Um, the um, percentage is staggering in my opinion. Uh, Sendium has found that over 40% um, nationwide of students um, do not end up matriculating on to college because of specific reasons. Um, so this, like I said, is a two-year grant. Um, we just finished our first summer of it and we're really excited to um, move forward. Um, so we were given a grant um, via Ascendium and it's a two-year grant. So as you can see, um, the first year we were given um, $31,550, and for the second year, we were given $21,350. Um, a lot of the grant funding goes into not only um, supporting staff, so I was able to hire four school counselors to assist me in this work. Um, two counselors from Preble and two counselors from East High School were assisting me this summer. Um, as well as we work directly with the National Student Clearinghouse. So they have been instrumental in providing us data um, as far as students from the class of 2018. And then um, we, in a couple weeks, will be getting back some uh, data from National Student Clearinghouse about students um, in the class of 2019. So I will be sharing that information with you um, in a board update um, once that data becomes available. Um, another big part of the grant budget is we um, partnered with SignalVine, and SignalVine is um, the texting platform that we use to communicate with students via the summer. We all know that students communicate, they live and breathe on their phones, um, and so our work this summer involved um, texting with the students to help them with anything that they needed to make sure that they matriculated onto college in the fall. <coughs> Um, and I'm going to share with you some preliminary data. Um, so we, out of the class of 2019, were able to work with almost 700 students this summer. Um, and of those almost 700 students, 613 of them over the course of June through August um, opted into our texting program. Now, I've had a lot of questions as to why did 81 students opt out? Well, putting my school counselor hat back on, I can say that when working with students, students who graduate in June, some of them are just done. They are ready to move on to life after high school and they no longer want to be contacted by school. So I get that. Um, another reason I thought of was, well, some students, a very small percentage of students have help at home with um, tasks such as completing the FAFSA. 
um, reading even a financial aid package um, on their university website, um, figuring out promissory notes and loan counseling. But that's a very small percentage. Um, and then another group of students, um, I know I worked with some students who at the end of the school year, they had a plan, but then they graduate and they decide to move in a different direction. So they may not have wanted to be contacted. Um, so my goal for next summer, because we just completed our first summer, um, is to increase our student participation by 20%. And I have a bunch of ways that I um, think that we can do that, and I'll share those with you um, shortly. All right, so looking at some of the percentages. Um, so based on our class of 2019 and the students that opted into the texting program, um, we were at a 49% um, participation rate. And when I first saw that number, I was a little disappointed. But when looking at some of the data compared to the other districts that participated in this program, um, we were um, one of the highest. So the average participation rate for the other districts um, within tech steps was 20 to 35 percent. Um, the highest participation rate was 77 percent, but that was a very, very small district with less than 100 graduating seniors. Um, but the other comparable districts, um, Racine, West Dallas, they had much lower rates of participation than us. And when Madison, um, they were um, pilots of this program a few years ago, so obviously a very large district, their participation rates were only 26%. So when looking at that data and then seeing that we were at 49%, I was pretty proud of the work um, that my team did this summer. All right. So moving on, so part of the grant funding um, is the data on the left-hand side that we're trying, um, or that we um, essentially want to collect. So we know that the class of 2019, there was 1,254 kids that graduated. Um, we know of those students, there were 602 of them that self-identified as um, students of color, meaning not white. Um, we know that there were self-identified 624 um, students um, who qualified for free and reduced lunch. And of the students um, who we surveyed at the end of the school year, um, they, of that amount, 548 of them said that they were college bound. So what we're trying to answer and what I will be sharing with you um, when we get the data back from National Student Clearinghouse is the questions on the right hand side. So I wanna know um, um, the number of college intending students who actually participated in the program and enrolled. I wanna know of that number, um, who of those students were students of color and who of those students were the economically disadvantaged students. Um, and we, just a note, even though the grant um, Ascendium really focuses on first gen, low income minority students, we as a counseling team worked with all students who participated in our program. Because I know as a school counselor that it doesn't matter who you are, there's a lot of confusing things that um, happen or, um, emails that you get during the summer from colleges and universities and students need a lot of help um, figuring out what their next steps are. All right, so as I had mentioned, um, in order for students to opt into our texting program, we had to survey them. We had to see where they were at. So um, we conducted a senior exit survey starting um, the middle of April of this year, and we concluded it um, beginning of May. And we were quite surprised um, as a counseling team to see where our students are at. Now, as a high school counselor, I try really hard to give my students all the tools and the information that they need to be able to complete um, those necessary tasks during the summer. But we found that there were still an alarming amount of students that um, needed a lot of assistance. So as you can see from the questions, um, a lot of our questions had to do with final transcripts. Now that as a counselor, I thought would be something that was pretty straightforward, but it seemed that our students still needed a lot of help figuring out how to send that final transcript at the end of the school year. Um, a lot of students were really confused about what it means to attend a fall class registration day. I kid you not, there's students that will say to me, well, Miss Simmering, I know I can just show up on the first day of college and I'll be, I'll be good to go. And I'm like, no, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't work like that. You know, you actually have to register for your classes and you have to take place, placement tests and um, just a lot of things that students aren't thinking about. Because when you have a, a senior in high school, all they're thinking about is graduating. They're not necessarily thinking about the steps in that they need to take, you know, June, July, and August 
to get to that next step. Um, we had a lot of students that were just nervous in general about going away to college or figuring out how do I buy extra long sheets for my bed at college. I mean, it's, it's things like that that as adults we don't necessarily think of, but these are things that kids are really worried about. Um, we had students who, again, didn't understand that you have to attend an orientation and you may have to take some placement tests to be able to be put into a math class or a language arts class. Um, and then a lot of questions about um, tuition and paying for college and doing that loan counseling and that promissory note. Um, and again, as a counselor, we try to give them the skills that they need to be able to handle those on their own. But a lot of that stuff, especially from the four-year universities, that information all comes out during the summer. And you know, if a student has nobody to turn to, or even you know, a parent reading through some of that information, it is confusing. So we really worked with, those were the top five questions um, that we worked with students on this summer. And we learned quite a bit in our first year. Um, we learned as a counseling team that um, doing a senior exit survey at the beginning of April, we missed a bunch of kids. We have a lot of students in this district that graduate early through a variety of different programs um, or graduate at the end of a trimester or the end of first, um, first semester. And so we missed a bunch of kiddos that we need to capture um, before we start um, the project for summer of 2020. Um, we also know that there were some dropouts that we missed. Um, and as a counseling team, we did our best to get into the schools and collect as much information as we can, but we're also full-time school counselors in our own buildings. So that was sometimes tricky to try and figure out how to capture all the students and what were the best hours of the day. And we worked with the other high school counselors at the um, various schools, but that was a challenge for us. Um, and we, we knew that students um, live and breathe by their phones, but we weren't quite sure if um, those students were going to be comfortable just texting with us or if they'd want to meet us at like a Starbucks or an NWTC campus or UWGB. Um, but really the students communicated primarily via the texting portal. Um, and moving forward, um, I worked with um, Gwendolyn Stramp's department to develop a pretty intensive senior exit survey. Um, and it was great but we realized that we probably don't need as much extensive information um, for this project to be successful in the summer of 2020. Um, so moving forward, um, there are a lot of things that we're gonna be changing for next year. Um, one of those things being, and I had presented this information to Dr. Langenfeld a few weeks ago, um, and she had given um, me some really good recommendations as well, but one of those recommendations was to utilize School Messenger um, to really get the parents on board. Um, you know, we know as adults that when students graduate from high school, you know, a lot of them are like, oh, I'm on my own, I don't need my parents, but we know that actually they do need their parents, they need their parents' financial information, and they need a lot of information from their parents to be able to successfully enroll in college. So we want to make sure that parents are more aware of this service. Um, we also want to work with Casa Alba to make sure our Hispanic community knows that this is a service that's available. Um, I'm a bilingual counselor at East High School, and I work a lot with um, my Hispanic students and their families who have come here and they have no idea what a FAFSA is. You know, they don't understand what it means to do financial aid. So we want to spread the word through Casa Alba. Um, we also want to work with the Somali Resource Center, CAMSA. Um, again, similar situations where a lot of these um, tasks that are needed for their students to matriculate to college are very foreign to them. Um, we also want to utilize our family engagement coordinators within the district. Um, and we um, utilize our career coaches within the schools as well, but I know that we can do more. Um, and I know that we need to start collecting that senior information now. So, you know, I, I'm also the GED Option 2 coordinator for the district, and I've already had a handful of kids graduate. So we can't miss those students. We have to make sure that we can collect their information so that we can at least text them and work with them this summer if need be. Um, and I'm actually going to be working with um, Katie Suko from... Um, She's one of the counselor liaisons, so we're going to be working to come up with a streamlined senior exit survey because we want to make sure that all students and all the schools are getting the opportunity to participate, but we want to make sure that it's all the same information. Um, so um, we're also going to be working with college community um, 
readiness department to make sure that this is something, when the grant funding ends, we want to make sure this is something that's sustainable because we know that this is important work. Um, even in just the preliminary data that I gave you, we know that students are participating and that it's a need, and we want to make sure that this continues um, through the coming years. So that is what I have for you. Are there questions? Awesome. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Sorry, you might have said this while I stepped out. Um, of the districts and the, throughout the state that are doing this, is there cross collaboration or any sort of networking or sharing of best practices? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I actually had the opportunity to go and present this information at um, the National College Access Network concert in Indianapolis in September, and I was able to collaborate with Racine School District. Um, I also have put in a proposal to um, potentially present at the Wisconsin School Counselor Conference, and I'd be collaborating. I want to collaborate with a smaller district because I'm interested to see some of their practices and how they got their students on board. So yes, absolutely working with the other school districts. Yep, you're welcome. Question on the top five questions chart. Yes. That you have outbound messages and inbound messages. Mm -hmm. um, does that, do those, does, do those numbers mean that out of 474 students um, that you sent a message to, only 204 answered, or that 204 answered in the affirmative, or what are those numbers telling so you? So the 204 means that those were the number of text messages that went back and forth about the topic. So okay. we sent um, 474 total, so 474 <laughs> students were sent the specific um, texting question based on how they answered mm -hmm. our senior exit survey. And then um, based on their responses back to us, we texted um, 204 times back and forth with students about that particular topic. And back to the collaboration question, I noticed that the numbers go down mm -hmm. in, on this. So there's way fewer students that have um, are taking care of their tuition bill or at least aren't responding back to you when mm -hmm. you ask. Um, and I guess I'm wondering if you've thought about um, in how to increase those numbers specific to the topic. Are other schools looking at that? Mm -hmm. Or, um, or, or <clears throat> is it purely I've taken care of it and I'm not going to – because I'm assuming some students got the message, took care of it, and just didn't respond to mm -hmm. So it's kind of hard because you don't know that, I assume. Right. Yeah. So when we were texting with the students, um, what's nice about the program that we use is they have auto responses based on how the students answered. So those auto responses would come back to us, and we could ask a question such as, you know, have you completed the FAFSA? It's yes or no. If the student says no, then the auto response would shoot out a more detailed question mm. to them, and then the student would respond back. So um, we were really impressed with the technology. Um, we weren't quite sure how that was going to work because that's a question that we had. We were worried about making sure that we followed through with those students to essentially finish that FAFSA. So the technology really helped us um, follow step by step and make sure the students completed those tasks. And, and because I was at your, um, uh, in your career center when you mm -hmm. were helping students directly, the, the, some of the, the students that have filled out the FAFSA before the summer don't come up in this number because their senior survey says I've already done that. Is that what you what you mean by the senior mm -hmm. survey indicating who you mm -hmm. need to send texts to? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yeah, because your work, as I know, goes all year round right. doing this kind of guidance. These are just the kids you're scooping up that, that uh, haven't quite finished the process that you want to make sure that right. they end up in college and... September. Right. And I can tell you, you know, you witness some of those students doing the FAFSA. I mean, there are a lot of students that um, have parts of their FAFSA that come back where we have to help them fix the FAFSA. And I can, that just for some reason is a daunting task. And that takes a long time for students to fix. And we have also um, a lot of families in the district where we have to do the FAFSA very differently. You know, we have families that um, either the student's undocumented or the parents are undocumented. And that process can sometimes take the entire school year because you send in a verification and then that verification gets denied. And then you have to send in more proof. Mm -hmm. So 
I mean, for those types of FAFSAs, I mean, we were doing those types of verifications even into the summer. Um, so, you know, this was a way for us to catch some of those students mm -hmm. because when the school year ended, they just weren't quite sure what to do. And that's a very um, kind of sticky situation and you have to be very confidential about those types of things. Yeah, right. Eric? On that topic, I noticed that too, if I had to hypothesize, it seems like these questions are kind of in the order that they were texted throughout the summer. And the farther you get into summer, the farther you get away from high school, the far the more you feel like I'm not going to respond to that. So that's what I was wondering about too. Yeah. We were texting in August with students who still didn't know, you know, how do I sign up or how do I go pick up a book at my campus or, you know, how do I finish my financial aid? So, yeah, I, like I had mentioned, I mean, I think students, they get through graduation, you know, they're sitting, they're sitting up on a perch and then they start to realize that, oh, okay, now it's, now it's middle of July. Oh, now it's August. Oh, crap, I better go buy those, those sheets for my bed. You know, it's just, it's little things like that, that um, we weren't quite sure what we would get, but we just got the plethora of different responses, especially when the middle of August hit and students were still reaching out for help. You mentioned getting, I'm looking back, the getting data from NCES, yep. is that data of college enrollment? So yes, so National Student Clearinghouse, the reason why I don't have that data for you today is because um, the clearinghouse gives universities and colleges in the United States a deadline. So they have to submit all of their enrollment information to the clearinghouse by end of October, beginning of November. So I don't have that report back quite mm -hmm. yet, but I'll be sending you an update. So yeah, I want to see how many of our kids that we worked with in tech steps actually then matriculated yeah. and went to college and ended up, you know, sitting in class on the first day. Yeah. So I'm excited to share that with you. Yeah. I just want to thank you, Laura, for this. Um, I was really impressed with where this can take us. I know that Lori Peacock was behind the scenes uh, through the college career in this, and as is Katie Suko, who is sitting back there as well. So thank you for all your work on this. Um, and again, I think this is a really important step for us, and I like the next steps that you laid out. So I think we'll leverage even more, but uh, thank you for all the hard work. Appreciate it very much. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Um, the next, the next folks that are coming up. I don't know. I've got Aubrey Sh uh, Shram and is Katie coming up with you? Oh, yay! Okay, good. Lori, are you just going to watch from behind? Okay, Lori is our director from College Career and Community, and she's just going to rest. These are her team members, though, who are going to speak to us about academic and career planning and just give us a brief update. Thank you for joining us. Hi. A little face thing. Okay. There you go. You one at a time. So, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness for you. Right. All right, I'm Aubrey Schramm, coordinator of College Career Community Readiness here for Green Bay Schools. And I am Katie Suko. I am the K-12 counselor coordinator and admin intern at Beaumont. And we're here to give you an update. I'll forget every time. <laughs> we're here to give you an update on ACP, academic and career planning, where we've been and where we're heading. Um, I found the long range ACP goals on our Green Bay School District webpage. They're not quite displayed on the screen because I didn't click. There we go. So these are our long range goals. I'm newer to the district. I started in January. So the first thing I did was tried to get a hold on where were we at with ACP. I knew my predecessors had worked on it, but I didn't know how far we were embedded. I didn't know um, how close we were to being institutionalized as far as ACP goes. And I had worked on the periphery with co as a college partner um, in and around ACP throughout Wisconsin, but never in a school district. So I wanted to get out there and figure out where we were at. So I went out and met with the counselors in each of our middle schools and high schools, as well as with the principals through Judy Wiegand and Renee Every and Andre Landwehr. And um, just kind of got the tap on things, the real perspective on where we thought we were at, what we might need to do. Every school was a little bit different with their interpretation and with their implementation strategies and where they were at. Um, so I came away from those meetings 
with some initial goals. Um, <clears throat> it was really important to keep the plan simple. I noticed that there was an overwhelming sense among the schools of ACP being a very big process that we were kind of losing sight of the fact that it really is about intentionally connecting students with themselves so that they can find a path that might be a good fit for them in the exploration process. So I want to help make it simple with high impact experiences at the forefront. Um, getting students out and excited about something so that they wanted to explore it further. Being intentional was important too, so that each experience built on the next. So there wasn't a middle school guide and a high school guide, but there was one, one page, one guide. Lori and I talked a lot about it. It needs to be one page. So we can all see what, the, what we're doing. Um, sixth grade activities, seventh grade activities, very clean and straightforward. Um, and wanted them to tie into each other and build upon each other instead of having random acts of career exploration. And then another piece that I was hoping to do is clearly identify the who, when, and where of each of those components. And I'm going to show you the plan in a minute um, so it'll make more sense. But on the plan, like who, when, and where are these things going to happen? So we're making sure we have equity across our schools and all students are reached. That one school isn't doing this and another isn't. Um, that one classroom is doing this, but we're missing a whole cohort of students. Um, we wanted to make sure we're reaching all students so that they all have the opportunity to gain self-awareness and figure out what their best path or, or options might be. And then determine the ideal venue at each school for keeping the conversation going and growing. I'm still working on this, trying to figure out what that venue might be. Um, and then providing Zello training by school in 1920 is something I've already started. That's a tool DPI has provided to us to explore um, careers. It's a, it's a pretty awesome tool, actually. And... Um, I learned that not everyone felt comfortable using the tool. And we had converted from career cruising and exploration tool to Zello in the last few years. And there was some clunkiness with that just because it was a change and it, we maybe didn't train everyone yet, teachers in the classrooms. And ACP is intended to be embedded across the school. It's very easy to say it would fall on the counselors because that's one of their realms. That's one of the venues they work in. But it really is intended to be embedded across the school, in classrooms, part of a teacher's responsibilities, part of principals, um, supervisors on the playground, may helping make intentional connections for students. So um, Zello training for all is really important. And then avoiding ACP, this was a, one of the number one pieces of feedback. Avoiding ACP being a, just a checklist of to-do items that we check off. It's just like one more thing. We don't, we don't need one more thing to check off. So if we can have those high impact experiences that truly help shape a student or get them excited, then I'll buy in, you know, that kind of thing. So those were the initial goals. Okay, Lori, could you click on the ACP plan there? Uh -oh. Okay, so it's small up there, but <laughs> I'm gonna go in here. On the first tab that you see, that is an overview of the ACP plan, just pretty much overview page. The next page is where you'll see, so the next tab over on the bottom, there you go, is where you'll see those grade level activities, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and so on. And the third tab, is where you will see the accountability tab, where currently principals are working on filling in the pieces, where they will offer each opportunity in what classrooms. We also, a really, really important piece of this is collaborating with our um, teaching and learning department and student services departments to crosswalk and make sure that we are aligning ourselves. So Katie's gonna talk a little bit about the alignment with the counselor curriculum. So first what we did is we walked through the plan and determined what things the counselors naturally own as part of their role in their realm, in the scope of their work. And so those are identified on there when you're scrolling through, you'll see that. Um, and Katie, do you wanna talk about that or we'll, we'll do that, we'll come back to that. 
Um, so this is a work in progress. This is where we're at right now. Most of, most of the document is filled in and I've begun the Zello training by school. Um, and when I go out to the schools, like for example, I went to, on, to Preble on Friday and I did new staff, a new staff training and then a refresh for current staff. And it's just interesting to share the plan because I kind of lead with that and why we're all being trained on Zello. Um, and it, it's just, it's a great experience to connect with schools that way. I love working in our schools, obviously. But, all right, if we can go back to the presentation then. Thanks. So the high impact experiences on the next page over. That's me, sorry. Um, all seventh graders will participate in a hands-on career exploration app opportunity. All eighth graders were invited to participate in the Find Your Inspiration event on November 5th that our chamber hosted. And they do three lessons in regards to that. So they do, the educator provides a lesson in the classroom to all students. Junior Achievement came in and did the prep lesson to get to introduce the venue to them on what they would be doing there to explore the different career clusters. And then they had a reflection opportunity after the event. Um, to talk about what they learned, what they liked, what they didn't like, and that kind of thing. This year we launched an ACP Career Exploration Experience Field Trip Initiative within our high schools, in particular targeting 10th through 12th graders. And Lori, if you wouldn't mind just opening the Fall 19 one. This just gives you a snapshot. Again, it's small up there. Um, but we we went through all of the career clusters and worked with our turbocharged partners to provide an exploration experience for our students. And our turbo partners funded those experiences, um, the transportation for our students to them. And UW-Milwaukee also funded our buses, our coach buses to go down um, to see their campus. And we also went to a Lambo for um, a behind the scenes, what makes the Packer organization tick um, experience as well. So far out of the seven, Trips that have gone out, we've had 503 students leave the, leave the school to go out and explore. And then when they come back, they're given a uh, reflection link to talk to us a little bit about what they liked about it, what they didn't like, what they learned about themselves. And we've asked them to add it to their Zello um, resume timeline to begin that use of Zello and to begin that um, creating their own academic and career plan. And then finally, actually I want to mention one more thing. We also built a sixth grade um, personalize your path course this past summer that has been implemented at four of our middle schools. So it serves as an excellent foundation for academic and career planning and launching that exploration process at those particular schools at this time. Finally, the individual student planning conferences in eighth, ninth, and 11th grade that Katie's going to talk about. Okay, so I don't know how many of you are aware, but school counselors work within the ASCA model, the American School Counseling Association model. And within that model, um, there's a specific, specific category called individual student planning. And that individual student planning really nicely aligns with ACP. And within the individual student planning, um, one of our goals was to align with ACP. So we had some meetings this summer where we met with a cohort of middle school and high school counselors. Um, I pulled in representation from each middle school and high school to be able to provide um, their expertise on, expertise on what their building had been doing. Um, because the goal would be is I want to figure out where we were, what our reality was, and how were we doing it, um, and hopefully to be able to align so we're providing that equitable experience for all of our students. So we met this summer, um, beginning, actually we probably started in the spring, gathered information on what are we doing, how are we doing it, what are we covering, um, in our high school and then also in our middle schools in regards to individual student planning. Um, and we got a variety of different feedback. Um, different people were doing it at some different times with some different formats. And our goal was to be able to come to consensus on how are we going to do this for all. Um, because I wanted to make sure that if we are taking components of ACP that we are for sure able to provide this opportunity to all students. So we came together and we decided as a group that we're going to be doing individual student planning in 8th, 9th, and 11th grade um, starting this year. In 8th grade, the individual planning conference is going to be done in a small group. Um, when you look at the ASCA model and you look at individual student planning, it can be done individual, in small group, or in a classroom setting. So as the counselors collaborated, we, made we wanted to make sure that we got everybody on the same page with this first year. 
Then we reflected, we provided feedback, and we came back with that next level of implementation. So for this year, um, it is guaranteed that students will have an individual student plan in 8th, 9th, and 11th grade, and we have similar content that will be followed in each of those buildings. So in 8th grade, they're going to be talking about hopes and dreams for high school. Because what we were learning is that it was really hard for them to connect to their post-secondary, all students. That's a really long range for kids when they're you know, 14 years old, 13 years old, to be thinking about, what am I, what am I going to do when I'm 18? Um, and the high, uh, middle school counselors, what they've said so far is they feel like the conferencing has been really valuable because it's given them that one-on-one, -on -one small group opportunity to talk about what are your hopes and dreams for high school, what might be some potential barriers to helping or to you getting there, and how do we help you overcome those? So they felt like those conversations have been really valuable and very authentic um, because the kids are also helping each other to talk about how do you overcome some of those barriers. Then in ninth and 11th grade, um, students will be having an individualized one-on-one um, -on -one planning conference where they'll be talking about, obviously, they'll analyze their current reality of their interests, strengths, hobbies. Um, they'll look at their test scores. They'll look at the courses they've been taking. And then they'll also do some advisement. So what does this look like for you? You know, are we looking at youth apprenticeship? Are we looking at taking ECCP? Are we looking at taking um, a certification program? Um, what are your hopes for a post-secondary, you know, as we get into 11th grade? Um, so the goal is really to start aligning those processes. Um, so we're providing the same opportunities to all of our students in 8th, 9th, and 11th grade at this time. One thing I didn't mention when I was talking about the ACP trips for high school students is that we also have funded um, a substitute teacher so that a teacher in the related discipline can go on the trip along with the counselor. And our hope is that then they can bring the information back to the school about cutting edge programs, new programs that are out there, their experience. And the intention with going to our turbocharge partners, Milwaukee, the different places that we've gone, isn't necessarily for the student to they have to go to UW-Green Bay or NWTC, but to open their eyes, get on a college campus, see what that's like, see what that's all about. And I know when I worked with the Gear Up program, that was a huge thing, a huge piece of it, was getting out and about and figuring out, oh, there's a lot out here. There's a lot of things to explore and maybe pique their interest in something. And it, then they start exploring the other options as well. So it can be a win-win for all of us in the partnership. As far as data collection goes, this is the data we currently um, can pull to see how we're doing in this regard. Zello data that currently loads into Infinite Campus, we can pull it from an ACP data wall to get a snapshot of different things about a student. Our counselors will be using that in their individual student planning conferences to see what personality styles, what careers they maybe went out and freely saved. And they can hit like, like it, love it, gotta have it, so they can rank their different careers um, and how much they like them. Institutions of interest, we can pull that data as well to see what our most popular institutions of interest are among our student body. Um, individual student planning conferences, we, can do we document those in 8th, 9th, and 11th grade, completed or not, parent attended or not. Um, the participation in a reflection on the 7th and 8th grade career exploration experiences as well as the high school ACP career exploration experiences. And our district can also pull data um, in regards to the redefining ready career and college readiness standards that are out there as well. Backwards. All right, next steps to move us forward. So as I mentioned, when we showed the ACP plan, our principals are currently reviewing and finalizing um, components of the ACP plan. I'm providing Zello training by school. The counselors have already been trained and a couple of our schools have already been trained um, on the system. And we're moving toward a train the trainer model so that we have people in each school that can continue to onboard the new staff that come on. Continuous collaboration and alignment is necessary between our schools, CCCR department, teaching and learning, CTE, and student services. Development of an ACP hub. We do have an ACP webpage right now, but it's important to tie all of the components together. So we created a scholarship guide now for all of our schools so that it's equitable across the board. We had separate scholarship guides on each high school webpage. We have one of those that I imagine would be housed there. All of our career pathways or programs of study so that a student can see all of their options for navigating college and career exploration in one hub place that will then be linked out to our schools. Parent engagement, 
um, our Find Your Inspiration Careers page that's a collaboration with the Chamber, pre-college program opportunities for summer, there's still a wide variety of things that we could list there. Um, family and community engagement. We're working with the Chamber on a community ACP publication with other districts that then they're going to be handing out at um, Prevea Health um, for people who come in for wellness checks with their kids and things like that to start building community around um, academic and career planning. And then collecting data to assess and evolve the plan. Um, looking at participation, looking at engagement, all of those things. So it's a true work in process, in progress. We're definitely in, I would say, the initiating and implementing phase, and I look forward to seeing some outcomes, hopefully at the end of the year, with some baseline data. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Did you want to go ahead? Go ahead, Dr. Langenfeld. I just want to thank you for this, and I know that um, next month we have um, Spencer Brownie coming from Achieve Brown County, and um, some of the initiatives in the other areas of our community really fit beautifully with the work that everybody's doing, and I know some of you are involved also with uh, Partners in Education, Parents We Need You, so really getting all of these things moving in the same direction really is wonderful, so I, I thank you for all your hard work on this, and and, uh, you know, it doesn't mean that every child has to go to college. It means that every child needs to know it's for them if they choose it. And we want to make sure that door is open and those possibilities are out there for each and every one. So thank you for that. Are, quick question. Are the, I know I was at um, ADW School of Innovation, I think, or, or, do, or John Dewey, one of the two, and they have a whole big, banner up there and all the individual areas of, of interest. <clears throat> Do you have, as, and you mentioned something about a website. Where, is it on our, those, those, um, career clusters. yeah, the career cluster one page sheets that kind of map out for you what, what each of the clusters look like. Pathways. I just think those are so our, yes, helpful. Yes, our career and, pathways are built into the course pathways. book. Yeah. So they're in the course oh, book. And the then they do book. poster okay. versions of them right. that are pretty catchy. Yeah. That okay. you actually, yeah, they yeah. draw you over. Are they on our website too? Do you know? I think I, I was looking I briefly, I, I didn't run across. I don't think I don't think there's separate PDFs on our webpage right okay. now. It would just be in the in the course in the books course on book our website. Right yeah. But that would we be that's that that what up. I mean when we build an ACP hub, that would be the perfect place right. to have that topic area and like list the underneath careers to to get a student yeah. engaged and hey, we have this here. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, I think those are very well done. Right. Katie? I just wanna say I really appreciate the passion that the three speakers have presented with tonight. And I can remember when Katie Suko was organizing career fairs for the fifth graders at Howe that uh, I'm glad to see that you, you've continued in this vein. With the fifth graders. That's right, that's right, that's right. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead. At this time, I want to um, uh, switch gears, and we are going to have an employee benefits update. Um, I want to welcome Melissa Theo Collar and Jennifer Vincent from our team, and representatives from M3, our partners, uh, Beck Krasinski and Cindy Van Est, and welcome. With our insurance company. Hi. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. No. No. All right. Yeah, thanks, Beth. So as Cindy and Beck are joining me at the table, I want to thank you for this opportunity. Last year, I was given the um, great fortune of being able to oversee the benefits portion of human resources with Jean Marsh's retirement. And although Jennifer and Mary are sitting back, yeah, Mary Pliner is sitting back behind me, they are really the entirety of the benefits department. We do have Angie Cox who also assists in, in some parts of our employee benefits. But what we're gonna talk to you about tonight, Mary and Jennifer are the entire department here in a district the size of 4,000 employees. So if you, if you think of all of the work that goes into 
providing benefits to employees. We are so fortunate to have Mary and Jennifer on our team, so I just want to thank them. And in addition to that team, we have the fortune of having M3 as part of our team as well. Um, we started working with M3 back in 2013, and this past year we did a request for a proposal and had a competitive bidding process where we received a number of bids from various insurance brokers throughout the state of Wisconsin and actually nationally. And M3 was selected from those brokers, and I think what stood out to the selection committee, and some of you are on that selection committee, members of the board, was M3's commitment to the health and wellness of our employees and not the bottom line dollar, but rather that health and wellness, because that health and wellness at the end of the day affects student achievement. And as you know, um, student achievement is, is why we're here and our students are why we're here. So hearing M3 talk and be so committed to student achievement was a, a really um, great asset for, here, for us in the district. So joining me is Cindy Van Assen, as I said, and um, Cindy is an, a senior account executive with M3, and she has been with M3 for a while. And we also have Beck Krasinski. Beck joined M3 this July. Uh, Beck was a superintendent in the Pulaski School District. I got to know Beck actually when I worked for WEAC, and Beck was uh, the union president for the PEA uh, in Pulaski. And Beck uh, also sat on your side of the table as a school board member in a school district north of here as well. So I'm going to turn it over to these two ladies who are going to guide you through our presentation tonight. Thank you, Melissa. Why don't you talk into that? Thank you, Melissa. Okay. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here tonight, and we appreciate the opportunity to uh, bring you some updates as to um, initiatives that we've been working on with the district and a quick overview, if you will, of how the plan performed last year. So Beck and I handed a packet out to you would really like to walk through a few of these initiatives while there are many in play. Our goal and our purpose is really the right care at the right time at the right place. Do we have access for members uh, when they need it? Um, what can we do with the employee benefits portion to help members stay in the classroom? How do we keep your teachers in the classroom and affect that student achievement? So on the first page here, one of our initiatives has been big into communication. We have continued to communicate the value of the Prevail Partnered Health Program, which was implemented in mid-July, the Bell and Nearsight Clinics, which we implemented in March, and the Onsite Health and Wellness Center here in the district office building below. You'll find in the packet behind this a trifold of information because along with the carriers that you have selected and partnered with for life and disability and the Bellin um, and Prevea Partnered Health, there's a lot of value added, hidden benefits within there. We created this trifold to get in front of people to have the information when they need it or available to share with colleagues. We did an on-site, we helped facilitate an on-site flu clinic that happened this November 5th. There were 1,025 flu shots rendered out and flu shots continue for free in the Health and Wellness Center. We held a vendor fair on November 5th. There were nine vendors there and 300 participants. The feedback that we've received thus far on the vendor fair has been very positive, both from the vendors as well as participant members who uh, were involved with that. We also have a benefit advisory committee that met September, October, um, that we meet with quarterly. There are 30 district staff members on that, and what we're really looking for here is engagement and feedback of the benefits, the perception of the benefits, and areas that we can just kidding. <laughs> continue to pro provide and expand on. The next benefit advisory committee is scheduled for December 17th. Great. So a couple of pieces that came out of the Benefit Advisory Committee lead us into the second initiative that we wanted to highlight tonight, and that's looking at the addition of telemedicine platforms and weight management programs. Um, again, looking at that right care, right place, right time, keeping folks healthy and happy so that they're able to achieve that work-life balance and be in the classrooms best serving our students or in any position throughout the district as an educator serving our children and our communities. So we utilize the feedback from that benefit advisory committee as well as from staff surveys and other information gathered from employees throughout the district to tailor those employee benefit offerings to meet the needs of staff, both based on anecdotal feedback as well as on data, which we'll talk more about um, in just a bit. 
Another piece that we uh, wanted to highlight as an initiative is the dependent eligibility verification. So the dependent eligibility verification is designed to ensure fidelity to the plan design and the intent, covering the folks that you intend to cover on the plan and not covering those that weren't intended to have that benefit available. Um, communication about this began already last spring, and there were multiple communications in the staff scoop, which resulted in a voluntary de-enrollment of 233 members from your plan. Also communications through the benefit renewal meetings, letters from human resources, and then the um, eligibility verification period will begin here within a, a few weeks, and a letter will go home from that uh, enrollment company, Impact Interactive, here at uh, the end of November. Additionally, human resources will have open office hours to help staff to provide those eligibility verification documents to submit those. The backside of that initiative page is just giving you some highlighted uh, pieces on the nearsight clinics. So the nearsight clinics with Bellin Health, Prevea, and then the on-site Health and Wellness Center. The Bellin Health Services and the Prevea Clinic Services offer primary care visit at no cost to members entering into for Prevea. It's any of Prevea's primary care clinics, urgent care clinics that includes family practice and um, pediatrics. Bellin Clinics, there are uh, specified Bellin locations at this time that are open to them. And then physical therapy is also open at a $10 copay per visit. The next area we would like to review is a, a busy dashboard in the packet. Uh, this is looking at our 2018, July 1, 2018 through June 30th of 2019, and looking to give you some highlights from what happened in that plan. We do monitor these trends and look at them year over year. And there's a lot of other components that are embedded in this. Our goal is to really bring you information on a quarterly basis to kind of see how the plan is performing. But how are these initiatives impacting these um, statistics as well and uh, providing the opportunity for members to get the access they need. So looking at this on the enrollment highlights, key things here, there are uh, 7,111 total enrolled members, 2,926 employees, and 615 retirees. That 615 enrolled entire retirees is actually down from the prior year, 2017-18, from 685. The back of this page, incidentally, are some key highlights that will reflect some of the things I'm saying. The district has put a lot of uh, time and energy in educating the retired population on what their options are besides just the district plan. So we believe that the uh, decrease from 685 to 615 is providing the opportunity and education of, around those resources. The average spend per employee per year is $14,289 in the 2018-19 plan year, and that's compared to a public sector benchmark of 16,452. The major diagnostic categories that we see happening in the plan are under the musculoskeletal, low back, neck, and joints, the digestive system, the circulatory system, the nervous system, and mental, and mental conditions on the bottom. During this plan year, the net paid spend was 41 million $811,000. That really breaks apart that 41 million, 48% of that was on your employee population, 17% on spouses, 22% on dependents, and 11% on retirees. Of that $41 million, $7.8 million was in pharmacy. On the pharmacy spend, of that $7.8 million, the member paid $390 just under 395,000. A key uh, consideration here is 85% of the meds that were dispensed were generic and accounted for 20% of the spend. Well, 15% of the meds that were dispensed were brand, but accounted for 80% of the total spend. The top five prescriptions that we see are in anti-inflammatory and anti-diabetes, psychotherapeutic and antidepressants, dermatologics, and then antihistamatic and bronchular. A key uh, note in the middle of the section here where it says preventative screenings, 5,102 
adult on the plan, in this plan year, of that 2,485 had a claim for a routine or preventative screening in this plan year. The mammograms and the colonoscopies, the database that's used here is looking at the American Medical Association recommendations, and it takes a 24 months watch to people who were uh, qualified based on the American Medical Association guidelines that actually got these services. So of the 1,653 identified as eligible for a mammogram in this period, 975 received a mammogram that was routine and preventative in nature. And colonoscopies, 1,912 and 320 routine colonoscopies. When we look at this, we're trying to understand what the opportunity is to educate the population and make them aware that these services are covered under the plan and they're covered at no out-of-pocket costs to the member. So opportunity to try to change and stretch our communication to hit the folks at the right time. The top five providers in the plan by net paid, St. Vincent's, uh, Bellin, Prevea, Aurora, and St. Mary's. Of these providers on the bottom, the district has really engaged in a uh, a more meaningful relationship with this Prevea partnered health program and open access to the clinics, as well as the Bell and Health clinics. We have and are in conversations with Aurora. At this time, Aurora's system does not accommodate or um, allow through their Epic Medical System for direct relationships like we've set up with Prevea and Bellin. And we'll continue to work with Aurora into 2020 um, at and help them develop this. They have the um, want to de develop it, not really the resources at the time to develop it. And then the top five chronic conditions, hypertension, diabetes, asthma, coronary artery disease, and uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The goal with the open access clinics, again, allowing people into the uh, primary care at the right time and the right place and remove those barriers, the goal down the road is that the medical systems have the information needed, the folks can get in, and the chronic conditions can be under a controlled situation. So given information from last year's plan on that dashboard, we wanted to also share information about what your current benefit offerings are for your employees. So the next two pages in your packet highlight the current plan information. The first is a benefit portfolio, and the benefit portfolio shows not only the coverages that are available, the carrier, the renewal, um, and a brief description, but it also shows the district contribution and employee contribution for um, assuming that an employee is a full-time benefit eligible employee who has completed their personal health assessment. So you'll see on the front page of that document the variety of health plans that are offered. There are a number of different options for employees to choose from so that they really can uh, make a, a good choice about which portion of their total compensation they'd like to invest in their health coverage and then make a, a decision that fits the needs of their family and their unique health needs um, as an individual or as a family. On the back of that document, then, you'll see coverages for dental, vision, and ancillary products. Um, earlier tonight, we heard comments about um, work-life balance and about making sure that folks are in classrooms. Of course, you know, as, a, as a former educator and I think continuing educator just in a different role, I want to see folks in our classrooms. And sometimes those pieces that take folks out of the classroom aren't just physical health. Sometimes it's financial health as well. And so those ancillary products really um, offer choices and options for folks to look at their benefits a little bit differently and have access to tools and resources that they may not um, be able to afford if if it were um, on an individual pay basis. You'll also see that the Employee Assistance Program, EAP, is listed on the bottom of that resource. Um, so again, your staff all has access to and their families have access to the Employee Resource Center uh, here in the Green Bay area, as well as um, access to those counselors and coordination with the medical plan. The next document then shows you how that plan is performing this year. So your health plan renews on July 1st. And so this data is shown October, excuse me, July through October of 2019. I'm gonna focus on the 
um, all combined column as well as the dental column. The uh, columns in the middle just provide additional information and break out the plan into different groupings. So when we look at all combined, there are 2,850 enrollments on the medical plan. We're at a 92% funding ratio right now, and that's compared to a 109% funding ratio for last year at this time. So the plan is performing much better, the population healthier, accessing um, less expensive care options this year than at this point last year. Please do. If you see on the that all combined and you see that line item Purveya and Bellin, that is the cost of what those direct access clinics are costing the district. And I, I think what is so critical to this, this partnership is truly innovative and M3 went to the table to Purveya and Bellin and negotiated this for us. They were able to negotiate those same services that we were funding through the plan at a discount to the district where the district, even with the, the employees not paying the 12% or the co-pays or that sort of thing, the district is still paying a lesser amount for those same services through that direct bill. And our employees are able to get those services for zero cost or $10 when it comes to the therapy. And we're still saving the plan money. And I think with those innovative ways of looking at how we are delivering that care while still um, providing really innovative services to our employees and without taking any money about out of our employees' paychecks and out of their pockets to provide wellness and care for employees is really where we're going to make an impact on the, the plan usage and on the cost for the plan. Thank you. So with those services, um, that just adds to the robustness and the richness of your health benefits plan as well. Again, having availability to access the right care at the right place at the right time so that we can keep folks in their positions. Your total costs on your plan come in roughly $1,000 under the public sector benchmark for all other health plans in the state of Wisconsin. On the dental, you also see um, a few more folks enrolled in the dental plan, 37, just, um, just shy of 3,800 participants on that, or members on the dental plan, running at 109% loss ratio compared to 111% at this time last year. Um, dental is very predictable because your benefits are very well defined, and we're not concerned that we're running at over 100% at this point. It's not uncommon in dental to see higher months in that uh, July, August, and September prior to going back to school. So we'll start to see that level off throughout the year. Our goal is to bring you regular updates on the plan and how it's performing, as well as we get into the data of the near-site clinic relationships and bring to you the data on how those relationships are performing as well. We will continue to educate the retiree population on what their options are and continue to engage with the advisory committee to get their feedback and understand where the learning opportunities are. Oh, and the last, oh, thank you. The last document uh, really is a opportunity where we are trying to keep our best um, estimate, guesstimate, if you will, of the agency support and activity in working with the district. So this is just a view of June through October. Um, again, the best guesstimate of the different varied areas within our agency that are working to support the district. To Melissa's earlier comment, the work that Melissa and Jennifer and Mary do uh, is paramount to partnering with us in trying to bring it, these ideas and innovation and working with the provider delivery systems as a, a strong partner. So our next... Our next steps um, with you will be in January. We'd like to come back with additional information as to how the plan is performing, uh, another um, update as to what if we're still trending at 92%, because as you know, in February or March, we come to you with the rate renewals. And rather than just showing up in February or March with information related to the plan, we want you to, to be educated and bring you along throughout the year so that you understand where our, our members' interests are and what the needs of our staff are, as well as how we're meeting those needs, and then how the plan is performing and, and what we can do from a proactive standpoint to not only uh, retain but also attract employees for, for the district. Do you have any questions? 
I have just a quick question, and I'll get to you, um, Rhonda. <clears throat> the the funding ratio. What what is exactly that ratio? Just so I'm clear, is it our money that we're collecting over the money that is being billed? Great question. So in the middle of that document where it says total plan costs, the total plan costs are the actual dollars that were spent between July of uh, 19 and October and the projected plan costs. So 14583 were the plan costs actual. And what we projected based on the premium rate equivalents that we had projected out going into July 1 at 15009000 So Brenda, the loss ratio, ideally, we will keep uh, in the mid-90s, under 100%. Um, premium dollars come in, claims dollars go out. Of that $15 million plan costs, the employees pay 12%. Right, okay. And that number is the number we follow in terms of projecting Correct. costs for... The, the next year. Yeah, like I said, Melissa. Okay. <clears throat> Rhonda? Uh, thanks for the, all the information. Um, so in regards to the Employee Benefits Committee, um, you said there's 30 staff members on that. How are those members um, chosen? Is it a self-select so we put out a number of communications, including a direct email at the beginning of the school year, um, soliciting individuals to serve on that committee. Oh, we actually did not turn away anyone from serving on that committee. Everyone who um, signed up who received insurance or was eligible to receive insurance was able to serve on that committee. And so I'm assuming that these meetings, they give you, so they, they give you feedback and, and suggestions and, and, and whatnot. Um, would it ever be possible to see some of that feedback in regards to your presentation? Maybe how you took some of that feedback and, and problem solve with it? Absolutely. That's something that we could add for our January update. Um, and one point that we noted in this presentation was the interest in telemedicine and the interest in the weight management programs came from comments and discussion that we had with the Benefit Advisory Committee. So we'll bring some of that information back in January. I would appreciate that, just speaking for myself, just to see how that committee is being used to determine what what we're being, you know, what we're, we're seeing, essentially. Thank you. What, one of the other things when we met in October was it was really clear from the members on the committee that they wanted to be able to go back to their schools and um, have robust and informed conversations with their colleagues with respect to the benefit offerings from the diff from the district, particularly with the new Prevea Partnered Health and the Bell and Nearsight Clinics. So they, um, we were able to give them, following the meeting, talking points that they then went back to their schools and um, their principals gave them time at staff meetings and they were able to discuss that inf information. We had some really, really um, motivated and committed members who made their own um, handouts and hung them up in the staff bathrooms and that sort of thing. So we're really encouraged and excited to see how the Benefit Advisory Committee can partner with the district and with M3 in, in um, getting out the word, and but also seeing and gathering feedback from their colleagues because we're not going to reach everybody, um, but gathering that feedback and then having that guide what we're going to be doing with benefits. Christina? Thank you. It's fun to think that there are employees that get excited about making bathroom brochures about insurance. Um, <laughs> like, there's something for everybody, isn't there? Um, so going, thinking about the chronic conditions of hypertension, diabetes, and asthma, I would imagine that a lot of that is connected to stress, going back to white work-life balance and feeling like, you know, no one has time to do anything anymore. Uh, so I'm curious um, with your initiatives and sort of your plan and then the committee, um, if you think in your January, if you'll have some updates on other uh, creative ideas we have as, as a district to, to preventatively tackle uh, some of those key areas. Great, great insight and questions. We will have um, information to bring along that way today uh, the employees and the spouses participate in uh, personal health assessments, mm -hmm. and those personal health assessments also outreach 
different conditions. And so there's a number of different activities that outreach today that we are hoping to link together all of the different pieces. Thank you. The 15% brand name brand. pharmaceutical use and then that's 80% of our total spending. <clears throat> I know we put some parameters in place a few years ago to increase the use of generics and things like that. I'm wondering if that of that 15% brand name use, what part of that could we potentially decrease and what part of that is because there is no other generic and that's the cost is what the cost is? I would tell you we're not prepared with that answer okay. today, but we can add that and bring that in January because we do have very detailed reporting on the pharmacy. Yeah, and I know we've put, we've worked, well, I don't know, five, we Five years ago or so, we worked, um, worked really hard to improve the, <clears throat> to make sure we're not wasting money on medication, essentially. Uh, Laura? Um, I just wanted to add that uh, I actually attended the flu shot clinic and the, um, the vendor's fair. Um, 1,025 flu shots is just amazing. And I gotta say, there was a crowd there um, and uh, a lot of very unhappy little children. <laughs> um, and the vendor fair, I mean, the, it, I don't know, it had a huge amount of people there and I was just really, really happy to see uh, um, all that enthusiasm. So well done. Okay, just a, a quick follow up on uh, your point about the prescription drugs, having just had my colonoscopy this morning, the only, okay. the low volume one is only available in, there's no generic. And I wouldn't want to discourage, I think our colonoscopy numbers are too low. And I don't want to discourage someone from, or us make it difficult for them to not do it because of the volume of consumption that takes place. All right, just putting it out there. There's always multiple factors in the equation. There are, all right, yes. right, <laughs> that this is... Something you have to do. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I did. At this time, I'd like to um, invite um, Dr. Judy Wigan along with her team, Noah Becker uh, from the in Intercity Student Council to come up. And I know Luke is prepared as well to um, Talk to us about weighted grades, and it's a guiding change document. And I know Judy's been working hard with the team, and I have the chance. Judy has been working very hard with the students. Uh, John Magus and Vicki and I sat in uh, to walk through this um, document, and I know that um, I'm sure Noah and Luke are very well prepared to present, and Hannah isn't joining us tonight, but this, these are our leaders from... ICSC, so welcome. All right, so um, did we hand out copies? We have They have electronic, yes. <laughs> 21st century. Um, so yeah, the guiding change document for uh, weighted grades. Um, it's something that has been on ICSC's mind for many, many, many years now, even before I came on as a freshman. Uh, Ms. Sorensen told us that they were trying to get these. And um, there are a ton of benefits to weighted grades. Am I going in the right direction here? Okay. All right. <laughs> um, such as... Uh, scholarship scholarship opportunities opportunities in our community um, that require a certain uh, GPA um, as well as things like NHS and other stuff as well can you just for people watching NHS National Honor Society it has a requirement of 3.5, in our district, you have to have a 3.5 GPA um, to be a part of National Honor Society. 
and uh, nationwide, it 3.5 is way above the average. And even th most of the districts that do require a 3.5 GPA have weighted grades already in place. Are you ready for questions, or yeah. did I mean, someone any... else want to speak first? Okay, you can go. Can you just give them an overall question? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, like the big question we looked at is if a a weighted GPA system will provide students access to more opportunities and recognition that aren't currently available, and so we're trying to take steps forward to achieve that. Yeah, I think we're ready for questions, unless you want to add something. Yes, no, go ahead. Yeah, go. Eric? So I'm uh, just a lowly elementary school guy, so if you could give me a uh, two-minute elevator speech, I think I know what weighted grades are, but could you help me understand it? So weighted grades would allow for advanced or AP classes. It would depend on the system we decide to use um, to be worth more in your overall GPA than uh, the regular base classes. For example, AP Physics, um, there are some districts where that is worth a 5.0, an A is worth a 5.0, a B is worth a 4.0, et cetera. And well, regular physics, the max you can get is a 4.0. Therefore, students can have a GPA above a 4.0, making it the NHS requirement way easier, scholarship opportunities and things like that. So if I got a B in AP physics or an A in regular physics, it would be the same, same. Yeah. for my GPA. Depending on the system we use, sure. there are a ton out there, but yeah. Thanks. Christina? What do other districts of similar size in Wisconsin do? Do we know? A lot of variation, but they generally will add um, AP and dual credit courses maybe, and that depends on the college you're working with, of course, and how much freedom you have with that. But AP courses, they generally will add uh, 0.5 onto your grade, but that's that's loose. That's not, it, it, there's a lot of variation even within the state. Rhonda. So I like your opinion, either one of you or both of you, on, um, on the guiding change document under why it says, to what degree are student enrollment and persistent and rigorous classes impacted by weighted versus unweighted grades? So allowing a weighted system would make it much more attractive for students to take more advanced classes because instead of, oh, I don't want to take AP Physics, for example, because it might hurt my GPA, because of the added boost, they might be more intrigued to take that course and not care as much about the difficulty level as much as they want to just learn the information. And it could impact the amount of students taking each courses, each of the courses so we could offer, potentially could change scheduling a lot. Um, <clears throat> so in the long run, I, I, I understand that argument and, and uh, agree with that. In the long run, the class rank system will still be similar if you're a person that got an A in an AP class or a B in an AP class. Your, how you come out in the class rank system um, will be similar to what, it, to what it is now. I mean, your grade point will be different. Because I know that's part of the, the um, one of the issues with this is the class rank system because I know some of the scholarships require you to be in <clears throat> top 10% of your class and, and those kinds of things. So, um, <clears throat> but it just, and I'm just thinking out loud because this just occurred to me at this moment, but it, it, uh, um, <clears throat> it seems as if the, the weighted grades won't affect your class rank as much as you might think it would. Do you follow what I'm saying? 
in terms of because if you if everybody has a 4.0 um, system of mm -hmm. a grading scale and you get an A in an AP class or you get a B then your grade point average your grade is four or a three but if it's weighted then you're put it on a five to make this easier mm -hmm. you have a five and a four so you're still the the so I I'm not sure I'd be interested in mm -hmm. mathematically and I'll um, let you guys talk about it a little bit. I don't expect an answer today, but it just is, because um, one of the questions I have, and it's not on this guiding change document, as I recall, um, one of the things that has come up in this conversation is that there are negative effects on students, potential negative effects on students who aren't taking advanced classes. And does that widen the the gap, uh, those kinds of things. So I would be interested in um, having that be part of your conversation because when this comes back to me to to vote, I would like to know because I get what it how it helps um, in terms of the advanced class classes, but I, I've um, I've only heard vague references to the sometimes there's disadvantages and that potentially might change the the scale you pick because um, it sounds like you can it's 4.3 is the best you can get or 4.5 you know, those kinds of things um, so those are the two questions that I have and um, would love to have that be part of your work and, and looking into those things as you uh, move forward and you can comment if you have a comment now but I don't expect you to have an answer to my questions <laughs> um so for the you brought up the point of how it, you, it might not change our class rank as much as you we would think, which I think is partly true. But also there are students who might not push themselves yeah. as much as others. And so then they might fall below then. And some of the disadvantages, yes, a student, for example, could be trying as hard as they could in a normal level class and but lose their class rank because of the weighted system. But... The scholarships that I've looked at, I'm currently applying to colleges, they ask for your class rank, but they don't care which one. So if we had both, they could put whichever, whatever one helped their case. Yeah, I had a conversation with a mom about that. I'd never heard that. You, pick one. you can pick yeah. one. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. Wow. I've actually suggested probably about three or four times, um, I think, but. I just find it interesting that the scholarship, that, or actually it was a college, that it was this, it was a scholarship that came through the college, and they asked, they allowed you to either provide a weighted grade point or a non-weighted grade point, but I don't understand why they can't just unweight the grades to begin with. That was an interesting um, concept to me. Yeah. Um. Yeah. For example, Stephen's point. One of the merit scholarships, the presidential scholarship, you have to be in the top 25% of your class, and they you can put down whatever class rank you want. And that is a massive scholarship to that school. Mm -hmm. And so that's interesting to me. You also have to have some other requirements, but yeah. Yeah. When, when it comes to um, final college applications, when you submit your GPA, usually they do unweight those, in fairness. So that piece, like, like you're not going to get into college over somebody else because of your weighted GPA. Right. But with scholarships, there tends to be l less of a focus on that. And usually, and I won't say that, oftentimes you can submit whichever GPA or more often whichever class rank benefits you if you have both. Both of them, yeah. Yeah. Rhonda? Can you summarize why you believe that this has been coming back and back and back and back. Personally, I think it's because of their, the benefits greatly, greatly, greatly outweigh the negatives. And to me, I, the negatives are currently happening right now. Anything that we would, if we did weighted grades, any negatives that you could think of are already in place. For, for example, like, um, how a student who tries really hard but doesn't take advanced classes 
but they can put down either class rank if we had both of them. If that makes sense. Yeah, okay. But this has been at ICSC for how long? And this what you're saying right now, you've probably said before. So knowing all that, what is the reason really why it's still status quo? I think because it there is controversy behind implementing it, which is a part of it, and it's a generally big change after a change was implemented in I don't remember which year one of you guys one of you guys would where pluses and minuses were added to the grades. It's probably so like four years ago. Yeah. Yeah. That's so Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So <laughs> it was so after that grade, I think it, I mean, I'm not going to speak for anyone else, but it would make sense if after that change, it, there was more focus on other changes. I think that's a big, I think that's a big part of it, but I'm glad the conversation's happening now at this point, so we can hopefully see where this goes. So let's just say it doesn't happen. Then what, what do you see happening or what's the state of, of that in general? For students, like if, if it doesn't actually end up being implemented. Yeah, go ahead. Well, if it doesn't end up being implemented, it, the negatives will just keep going on and it will keep coming back to ICSC. There is uh, interest in the lower the newer people who will definitely continue to want great weighted GPA. Can you just state one more time the negatives that you believe will be happening? The negatives that I am aware of and that have been brought up to me would be that if, we, depending on the system we use, um, students that aren't in advanced classes they could be at a disadvantage because their class rank would then be lower than those in more advanced classes and i think what the um when the, when we changed the grading scale when you were in seventh grade um the the sentiment from the students at that point was they were um happy because their ap courses wouldn't, we're no longer at a 93%. And so the students in, the, in those conversations during that time felt that, that that was enough of a change, that they felt that it would help more students take AP credits knowing that they needed only a 90% to get an A instead of a 93. So I think that that was the, the sentiment. And then over the, since that time, um, I think there's been just more specific <clears throat> examples, I think around scholarships that um, because prior to that, it was obvious that weighted grades, like you said, Noah, didn't help you get into college um, because they, everybody unweights them. But, and there was, at the time, we thought there was one scholarship that had a class rank uh, attached to it. And now it's becoming more evident through your, your, the students bringing forward more and more examples of the fact that it's, it's not just that one scholarship. There are other cases where class rank is important. Go ahead. I think one of the opportunities that I see as a difference having sat um, with our students is the fact that Dr. Wiegand is here and that the leadership is meeting with the central office folks because in the past what was happening is we went from month to month to month, but we didn't have that central office support for this particular effort, even though it was in the Constitution. So we're in the place and space we need to be. And so when we meet, we can move things more quickly than if you're back once a month on a Sunday. Am I right or am I? I, I really see that as, as one of the significant change opportunities that um, we, are, we are doing now that's different from in the past. So things didn't get missed periodically over time. So I, I, I just put that out there. But I, I also know that um, Dr. Wiegand is, is owning this and helping the students move this 
um, because we all agree that this is something that um, the students really um, are are really wanting to move and um, included in in um, agenda manager is a whole uh, document that outlines the calendar as well and the steps that are going to be taken so that this does become a reality and there's a commitment uh, to to moving that and calendar it out so Laura I was wondering Judy if you can offer any um, insight into why there's been resistance for so long do you have anything that um, any special insight after all the years you've spent as an educator um, no, actually, I was a bit surprised um, that we don't have one. Um, um, coming from my previous um, experience in having both a weighted um, GPA and a weighted rank. Um, but again, I know that the tide changes and sometimes districts move away from it uh, and so forth. So again, um, it'll be interesting to continue to explore this and have the students um, bring forward a recommendation. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Good leaders. The, ne the next item I have, I'd like to schedule um, a retreat in January, if at all possible. Um, it'll be here before you know it. And what we'd like to do is go back and look at the the work that was done and, and revisit our enrollment numbers and look at um, what is the next steps around a redesign 2020, some of the different things that we talked about in the past, but also wanting to really bring that conversation back in a retreat fashion and, and look through um, what's out there and in terms of the, the uh, Mike should have the projections by then and really spend um, some significant time again back back in so that some commitments can be made. We've got some things that might be, are pressing um, that need some decisions um, by the board. Um, so I'd like to look at just and get a date on the calendar for that. Yep. Um, unlike last time, are we able to have an agenda on what we'll be discussing ahead of time before we get into the retreat? You know, I think I think we can put whatever you, I'll work with Andrew and uh, Brenda, and we'll make sure that you have what you need so that you feel confident in being able to have all the picture. The other piece of that, I know that we had Casey come and help us with that, and um, I don't know if the board is interested in that or if we can just uh, we'll just bring it ourselves. Either way, I'm open. I so. The, Casey was the facilitator who came and walked us through in the in the July retreat, mm -hmm. and I don't know if she's if that's something you're interested in. And I'm again, I said we can, we can certainly do it, but um, um, I'm open either way. I think what's important based on what's happened in most recently with regards to Jefferson, that I mean this is an open meeting. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. And that it's important that people are aware of what we're going to be considering, discussing. Mm -hmm. And I wonder about having a facilitator if it would make it more feel like it was more controlled and more about us and not about collaboration with the public. And would there be a time that public could have commentary? Um, I, I would even consider changing the the context of the name of the meeting, if possible, especially considering what we're potentially talking about and the gravity of what that is, mm -hmm. that we would uh, look to even just reimagine what that experience could be mm -hmm. um, to avoid re repetition of what happened. So um, I'm just throwing that out there. What would you suggest? Uh, well, first of all, again, um, having the considerations ahead of time so that they can be, we, we can know about them and they can be made public so that people are aware of what we're going to discuss um, so that they could give some, some feedback as well um, because I think that's important. I was interested in your suggestion of calling it something else. And that, um, uh, even if it's just, the redesigned 2020 
um, co community collaboration, collaboration community retreat, something that actually doesn't just by title say it's just us, the board, and the superintendent. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. One of the things that will be an outcome of, of this time together would be to make sure that there are some decisions by the Board of Education in terms of next steps. And so I, I'm not sure what time allotment we're thinking um, because I think there's a lot of data and a lot of information to go through. Um, my, my question would be, I'm not sure how that would look um, and how you can I think there, the board has to have some deep discussion in terms of just what the data are and what where you have um, interest in going, and then and then frame it so that then you know maybe that's something then you could engage your community in. I'm not I'm not sure that the board will will be in a place where people would come to respond when the board hasn't had the discussion. They're certainly welcome to come. I'm not suggesting that. I'm not saying that, that I'm just trying to figure out how to, to um, I wouldn't want people to come thinking they're gonna to react to something when there's not, the board has to decide what they're, if that, am I making yeah, sense? Making sense? Okay, good. I just don't want it to be disingenuous. And to that point, okay, and I can agree with that to a point. Um, so then is it possible then to consider, again, unlike last time, that we could record this retreat Absolutely. and that it's available for people to watch yes. and view? I, that, I mean, that's up to you, but I would Put suggest your, that. your microphone on. I, yeah, I, I would very much suggest that so that people could, and then you would, could get feedback as community watch. Perhaps they aren't here, but could give you feedback along the way, yes. Christina? To both of your points, and Michelle, I apologize if I might have missed this in the timeline with Jefferson and all of this with the redesign. Is there another opportunity that's coming up for the community to be, aside from the board retreat or whatever we're calling it, to look at the data and, and be a, have it, to have it maybe a, a different but similar conversation? I'm not, I'm not sure I understand. If we record it and it's attached and the data's all there, right? But what, they, are you, what are you looking for beyond that? Well, I'm looking for an opportunity for people to actually have a conversation about it and oh, to digest yeah. the information. Yeah. So I'm just in asking. A, in a yeah. meeting format? You, in a community you, format. Yeah. 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 Not okay. in a meeting. Yeah, not in a traditional meeting, yeah. but in a some type no, but of a, a a forum. Gathering. Yes, yes. Right. Yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. And when is that? When would that happen? And do we already have something? No, no. But we could do something. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. We have a, lot, we have a fair mm -hmm. amount of time. Okay. Yeah. So, no. Because I think both of the Your points microphone. are important, but I agree. I think, yeah, like the board meeting doesn't seem like the best. No, yeah. yeah I, the, I, I know that's right. 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 Then, but it still yeah. deserves consideration yeah, as absolutely. an opportunity. Yeah. Yes. All right. So, how much, <laughs> how much time? Do we think we want? Well, I mean, are we looking at is four to eight, five to nine? Do we need four hours, three hours, eight hours? Last time we spent about seven hours, I think. I would say three, yeah. I would say, but it won't all be new, and we can, um, to, to Rhonda's point, we can flip the classroom and give you the Data. Can you put your microphone on, please? Thanks. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry. Okay. We could we could flip the classroom basically and give you a lot of things to look at before you come, if that matters. And that mm -hmm. way, I'm thinking three to four. You three know, to four you, hours. If, yeah. If you okay. say if you th say three and then it runs over, I wouldn't want. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, yeah. Yeah. So. <clears throat> Laura. I'm. Good. I thought that the last time the facilitators um, did a good job of keeping us on task, forcing everyone to participate fully, and um, probably saved us time by not letting us veer too far off track. So um, my request would be that we do that again to make sure that we maximize that time. Yeah. 
um, Christina and then Rhonda. So I would just, I think we could look at, um, what is it, the Monday after our January meet board meeting was at the 13th? Actually, Rhonda, I, you... Um, she had a question. Yeah, she had a question well, about the facilitator. I, I want to make a point about that, too, so oh. just on a second. Okay. I just want to also say, too, from a scheduling perspective, an evening would be better for me. I can't afford financially to take a day off of work unpaid unless we're going to get paid for it. So I just want to put that out there for me personally. And then in terms of the facilitator, I agree with you, Laura. And I think, Rhonda, going back to your point, I actually think, for me, it feels more... It feels it, it it felt better that there was an outside person facilitating it, so that it, it ensured that there was equity of voice rather than it being led by admin, the administration. So, to some of the concerns you said earlier, I actually felt like the facilitator sort of got past that and was sort of addressed that. Um, so I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I would say, had I known the way things were going to proceed and be carried out, mm -hmm. I would have probably asked much different questions, much deeper questions. Um, I would have spent more time. I don't know if the goal is to be timely or thorough. I'm not sure which one of those the goal is. Um, but I would say I would be hopeful that knowing, again, what that looks like and what potential considerations may come forward that I think, um, yeah, I, I liked the facilitation because it did draw voices up, but at the same time, I think we all now know what we're really doing and what this really could potentially look like. So I think it's important to make sure that it's allowed that there will be some serious and deep questioning happening. If, if that can coexist, mm -hmm. fine by me. Yeah. Yeah. Laura? Michelle, you mentioned the potential of maybe some, um, talking about some items that were outside the redesign 2020. Did, did I hear that right? Like you said, there was other things you wanted to cover as well, possibly? Mm -hmm. This was entirely about the redesign issues. Okay, good. Thank you. She, brought, she mentioned projections. That maybe that's what you were thinking. I don't, I don't quite remember what you said. I just sounded like maybe there were a few other little things that you might want to cover in that space. But if, you, if not, that's fine. So four hours? I mean, if I we four. we can at least get some of the work done. It's, there's a lot more and left. Decide next, decide next steps at the yep. meeting, yeah. And there's a lot of things. <clears throat> All right. Um, so we'll start with the Monday. We don't have a board meeting, which is 13th. Um, we can start at 4.30, 5. What works for, five what, what works for five. 5 for you? 5? Okay. Nine. So 5 to 9. Potluck. Potluck. Yeah, we could have since we're here so long. Right. We just get sandwiches or something. Yeah, we can. If you Rhonda? Okay. So, is there any interest in maybe taking that and titling it in a different way? Yeah, we'll work on that. Okay. Thirteenth. Andy, do you have enough notes so I know what I need to do? <laughs> okay, good. So, I got lots. Just want to be confident. All right. Okay. okay. All right. That was good. All right. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, I do want to, um, the last thing I have, and I know I've had a number of things, it's, this is very important, and I, I want our community and uh, to know that this is American Education Week um, by the National Education Association, and I want to thank Betty Kosick, who is here tonight as part of Green Bay Advocates for Public Education, who shared this with me and with us, um, to really talk about the importance of public education. So it's a week-long celebration. Um, today is the kickoff day, and I, I think about the extraordinary lift that our educators do each and every day and the depth and breadth of gratitude 
um, and the life, we talk life balance. And I think about um, the gentleman that spoke earlier, uh, the state report card just came out um, in the last three years, we've increased almost five points. But what we really see is a big, a big shift in our mathematics and uh, in particular, some significant growth this last year in particular that is something to celebrate. But it is the result of a lot of heavy lifting and so we have to make sure that's the balance. We have 21 schools now who um, showed a significant improvement and um, we've got, last year we had 10 who um, exceeded, who met or exceeded expectations exceeded or significantly exceeded expectations. This year we're at 21. So we'll, we'll be sharing some of that next month so I won't go too far down that road. I want to also, um, so I, a huge note of gratitude to all the work that's going on in our schools and our gap closing and every day uh, people come tirelessly to work to serve children and families and for that we're really grateful. Our, our teachers are extraordinary and so the other piece I wanted to share with, with um, everyone is we've had an opportunity now this year starting the Extra Mile Exceptional Customer Service Award. And so I wanna thank all of our parents and students. Um, we actually had some former students nominate uh, folks and staff. And um, all you have to do is go online, right, Lori? Go online and acknowledge and recognize employees for going above and beyond. Um, can be teachers, it can be anyone who supports children in this educational journey, any part of our organization can be recognized. And what I have found is when we go and give these awards away, that the people um, that work so hard each day, it tells us how important it is to acknowledge what people do and recognize them and thank them for, for their work. So I encourage people out there to to go online and nominate someone, um, it, it means the world of difference to their work every day just to be feeling valued and recognized as part of our district. And of course, they are exceptional people who deserve to be honored. And uh, we, we have many, many more people um, in our trenches and, and workforce that should be recognized. So please, please come on out there. And again, join us in celebrating American Education Week um, so that we can honor and express our gratitude to our teachers um, and our staff in each and every school that we have the privilege of being uh, supported and serving our children each day. So lots more to that, but um, I know that Lori's gonna put some things out tomorrow as well to make sure that happens. It doesn't align with Teacher Appreciation Week, so it gets a little confusing, but Monday is the kickoff day. Tomorrow is Parents' Day, so parents are invited into schools. I'm not sure where that's at. Education Support Professionals Day, Educator Day, and then Substitute Educator Day. We call them guest teachers, and we're fortunate to have many who are extraordinary as well. So that's it. All right, thank you very much. Uh, next is Intercity Student Council Report. I'll turn that over to Luke. And... All right, so there isn't a ton of news on sports because we're in that transition stage of uh, fall to winter. East Musical is white Christmas this year. It's going to be in December. Um, there is a math meet at Preble tonight. I'm sad I couldn't make it. Um, Southwest, we're doing Chicago. We started preparations for that. That'll be performing in February. Preble's musical is going right on right now. They had performances last weekend, and they have more performances upcoming this following weekend. Um, bands are getting ready for the holiday parade, which we'll all participate in on Saturday. Um, West on November 12th had a talent show, and Joel Penton um, spoke, and he's a notable public speaker. ACTEC, all four of our high schools made it into the regional level for Wisconsin, which is pretty good. That means we're the top 50 in our region, so that's pretty good. Um, JDAL had their first event night of the year on the 14th, which is a big deal for them, obviously, because of their project base, and they get to show off to everyone who comes to go. Um, we had Good Ethics Day where... I had strep throat, so I could not make it, but um, I love that event, and I'm sure that went well. 
And right now, ICSC is talking about school start times. And yesterday night, uh, we had a school start time. The school start time committee come in and talk to us about that and three possible um, alternatives. Mm -hmm. And I think it went really well. Um, Ms. Sitnika was there, and I thought that it was a very good conversation. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything? All right, Andrew. Um, what was the student participation at the forum with the uh, superintendent search committee? I do not know. Okay, thank you. Two. But they had surveys. They had surveys too. Filled out surveys and all kids filled out. Surveys. Yeah. All right, thank you, Luke and Braden. Next is our legislative liaison report. I'll turn that over to Laura. Thank you, Brenda. Um, on November 1st, I was in Stevens Point to attend the, um, the uh, Policy and Resolution Committee um, meeting where um, we met for the last time to talk about the resolutions that are going to be before the um, convention in January. All three of our resolutions um, passed through. Um, just a reminder, if anyone um, needs reminding, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, the three are um, waiting all English learners at, at 1.2 FTE in the general school aids and revenue limit formulas or providing categorical aid based on EL status. Um, this would be made available to all districts. Uh, the second one is categorical aid for transportation in high poverty districts. This would be asking for new monies. Um, um, everyone seemed, and everyone at this conference uh, seemed to understand that this is a huge equity issue. Um, categorical aid, the third one is categorical aid to support social and emotional learning for public, uh, all public schools. Uh, this would be also asking for new monies. Um, and I was chosen to direct the discussion regarding this particular resolution at the Delegate Assembly in January. Um, with regard to um, the resolution submitted by Wausau about um, Native American mascots, which our district is a co-sponsor to, um, that also passed and will be addressed at the convention. Um, at one point, and this is not the first time, it looked like uh, there might be a majority of members who could be persuaded to water down the resolution. Um, but then <laughs> a, um, a member from a district that still has a Native American mascot made the mistake of offering an amendment that talked about starting the conversation. And um, it was like turning on a, a, a switch. Uh, everyone in the room kind of went, no. Um, and, uh, you know, my observation was that uh, no one in the room really believed that starting the conversation is really sufficient anymore. So um, it passed through without amendment, and um, it's going to go uh, to the convention where um, pretty much everyone I've talked to said that it will have, um, there'll be a lot of discussion and a great deal of pushback. So, um, what's that? Go ahead. When you said potentially water it down, what do you mean? Um, microphone. Laura, your microphone. Oh, sorry. Maybe I can find a, um, one of the, oh, I don't have it. People try to, they offer up these amendments, uh, trying to, um, I, wish, I wish I had an example. They're just trying to make it less strong. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, the whole thing about starting the conversation, that's a way to do that. Instead of saying, this is what we believe, this is the change we want, they um, say, well, maybe we should have stages of development or whatever. And pretty much everyone in the room is like, no, we're not doing that anymore. We've, you've had years to discuss this. And, um, but the thing that's going to happen probably at the convention is that the, um, the, the school districts that still have 
these mascots are going to say this is a local control issue. And this seems to be um, the course of events whenever this comes before this, um, this delegate assembly. Um, so I'll be interested to see if, um, if it makes it through. There seems to be a lot of, of doubt whether or not that'll happen. So, um, uh, Sorry, one more. Go ahead. But other than they have mascots, and is it just a matter of it's a lot of work to think about coming up with a new mascot? Is it just to, like what is their problem and their general problem with it? And have they said even said what that was? I just can't imagine in 2019 that you are even flinching on this. Well, you think, but <laughs> but the truth is, is that there's actually a great deal of history around this struggle. There's years of people trying to do this, and all this, all this, all this politics. I guess is how you would. Um, and then during the course of this conversation, a lot of that comes up again. There's people there that have a long history with all this, and that I don't have. So they'll be like, "Well, don't you remember ten years ago, such and such a town?" Um, tried to, um, or you know, tried to do such and such, and and then, you know, they brought it back to their school board, and they had the discussion, and they went through all the work only to have it be voted down. Um, or, or, you know, trying to bring the public along in the, these communities, trying to bring the students along. It's not all about money or the difficulty of changing it. it um, the, these schools are fairly entrenched. Um, about about these mascots, and they um, have people in their communities with um, megaphones of some sort that really can um, control the the dialogue, and and that has played out over many decades. So go ahead, Brenda. And I <clears throat> I think too it's a uh, because you'd think there is a small minority of districts that still have Native American mascots, but the local control um, issue will be a very strong sentiment, I would guess, mm -hmm. because because it's we are a local control state, and, and if you pass this and tell districts what to do, what's next? And so there's enough people to say, well, if the school board is going to start telling districts what to do, then there might the next thing that comes around the corner might be something that I... <laughs> Even though I'm in favor of of the resolution to um, to uh, eliminate the the mascots, I might not be in favor of the next thing that the school board association does. So I'm guessing that that'll be part of the yeah, conversation. I mean, did, did that that come up in your? Oh yeah, there's, there's a lot of it, and, and honestly, a lot of it's couched in the local control thing too. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, they talk a lot. There's tradition. There's all this stuff. So. None of this would surprise you, you know, like there's nothing about this that uh, can't be anticipated, um, but it needs to play out. And I honestly, at this point, do not know how this is going to play out at the convention. I did see it. I don't want to quote which district, but there was a district recently that uses a Native American mascot that is using this conversation and, and starting to, I mean, I don't want to say start the conversation, but is going to thinking about the superintendent recommended a change. So I think that... It, Ultimately, what this amounts to is is collective peer pressure to start to say to the small minority of districts, hey, people aren't okay with this. There might not be any teeth in a resolution that we can force them to do it, but if it at least draws attention to that issue and can further the conversation in those districts, and if we can go from 30 to 25, well, that's a, that's progress. But I, I, I'm familiar with a community that has made the switch. Um, where they had a Native American mascot and they recently have switched. And I know that like from the alumni and from, you know, the school board members are getting, you know, this is a major issue in smaller districts because this is the way we've always done it. And I graduated as a, you know, this was my mascot and that's the way I want it to be forever. And I'm a voter and I'll make sure you're not on the school board anymore. If you don't support, you know, that that's, that's not, not that it's right. I'm just, that's uh, what's happening in some of these districts. So I appreciate the update. One, one of the things, um, I can't remember what school district was talked about, how they put it in the hands of the students and said, if you do all this work and get petitions and you, you go to your community and go door to door, 
we will listen to you, only to have the kids do it all and have the board vote it down. Mm -hmm. So, like, that's part of this history that I didn't know about, and there was a lot of discussion about these various attempts over the years. Um, so, go ahead. Do you believe that the native voice isn't there? No, actually, there's a person on this committee who's a Native American and um, obviously a school board member as well, and he spoke very eloquently about um, the need for this, um, quite persuasively, sort of like the people that came before us. Um, and he was able to give a lot of perspective, though, I mean, he wasn't the only one. There was plenty of you know non-Native people, too, that were, feel very strongly about this and um, a lot of blunt kind of speaking about it. So um, it was super interesting, but um, honestly, I can't tell you what's going to happen. So, um, okay, so then there's a couple of bills that I'm, I'm tracking. Um, uh, Senate Bill 494, which would restore the school district revenue limit adjustment for energy efficiency projects um, with some account uh, new accountability measures. Uh, this is something that I know our district has benefited heavily from until the legislature eliminated it. Um, so this bill would largely restore that. Um, there and there was a public hearing on this on October 22nd um, and also something I thought was really interesting there's a draft bill right now that's being circulated to gather support for allowing retired teachers to return to work for three years without having to give up their pensions um, this bill would increase the minimum retirement age from 55 to 59.5 via incremental steps this is in direct response, obviously, to the teacher shortage um, in Wisconsin, which is a direct result of Act 10. Uh, and then here's a scary statistic. Um, in 2009, there were 12,624 teachers, or potential teachers enrolled in Wisconsin preparation programs. In 2016, there were 7,878. So, um, Every single district is dealing with this. Um, I think our district probably has more resources and, and ability to deal than most. I, I, actually, I, I'm speculating. I don't know if that's true, but I think we're doing a pretty good job compared to some of the other districts and people that I've spoken to at some of these conventions are just um, at their wit's end as to how to deal with it. So, um, And then on the day after this uh, delegate assembly, um, or this resolution committee, um, I attended the uh, legislative advocacy conference in Stevens Point as well. Um, I could not link the material that was covered at, uh, on, to our agenda, um, but the members of the board can go to the WASB um, legislative update, scroll down to the item that talks about the legislative advocacy conference, and click on the link you will have to set up an account. Um, I talked to Sandy about this today, um, using your district email address and then choosing your own password. And then you'll be able to go in and look at all the things that are linked to all the various things that WASB does. Um, there were some good things um, that they, um, that were presented. Um, for instance, uh, trends in school resources and equity, education and public opinion uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, this was and this that was presented by uh, Professor Charles Franklin, who does the Marquette uh, Law School poll, which was very very interesting. Um, and I highly re recommend that everyone go and have a look at some of this stuff if you know if this sort of thing interests you. Um, but there's a lot of data and maps and changes in demographics, and it was fascinating. So, and that's my report. I think we also need to choose a delegate for the WASB convention in January, and I'm ha happy to do that again for the for the third year. Um, I have to be down there Tuesday night anyway, and um, if and then there's a orientation at eight o'clock the next morning. And then the delegate assembly um, is right after that. And I have to be there anyway, so I'm saying I'm happy to do that if that's okay with everyone else. What? Uh, go you just seconded yeah, second. your proposal oh, there. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were volunteering, Eric. <laughs> I'm happy to have you do it, too. Are you? Okay. Yeah. 
I was good with that. Oh, the, oh. All right. well, you're going to be there. Or you'd have to, no, you're not going to be there, are you? You're coming on Thursday. A Wednesday? Okay. Don't don't we have a second vote, though? No, that's only when you're on the board. Oh, not if you're on the, not if you're on the committee? I, I can... Microphone. The Microphone. I can vote. I can be on the resolution committee and vote for our district. Do the voting for our district. I can do both. But she's not an extra vote like Mike was when Mike was on the WASB board. Yeah. Then we had a second. Yeah. But so, but we do need um, um, an alternate. An alternate. So. Um, or just in case something happens to you. I guess it would be if she got sick and couldn't be there or had something else come up. I can be the alternate and change my plans if something. Okay. Right. Are you yes. coming Wednesday? I'm coming Wednesday. Yeah, because it doesn't start till one thirty. Oh, so well, yeah. the assemb the assembly starts there. at one thirty, oh. but the orientation starts at like eight or nine in the morning. Oh. So if you've never done it before, it's a it's kind of important to go to that because it's not the system they use for you know, hold up car all this stuff. But you're 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 smart. You, you figure it study. out. Yeah, we can keep. We can help you. <laughs> We can I'll we can orient you. And we'll change my okay. Yeah. All right. Too. That completes my report. Oh, actually, I have a question. Okay. That where is this uh, the materials from the convention on the website? Yes. Yeah, so you go to the um, what WASB legislative update. Okay. Scroll down. You know how they have yep. all the various um, articles, and go to the one about that that and and click. It's going to ask you to put in your um, user oh, ID, which is which is your district, okay, and then so you have to make here. up your own um, password, okay, and then that will give you access in the future, okay, thanks, and to everything. So, all right, um, district events. Does anyone have anything they'd like to announce, Dr. Michelle, Dr. Langenfeld? I just um, I had the opportunity to attend. Um, West sing out and uh, the master of ceremonies did an awesome job and he just happens to be sitting at the table so I wanted to give him a shout out he did a great job so well it was not he was good he's recovered yeah and if the Mamma Mia show if you like dancing and Ava it's there for you let me tell you it's great so Andrew? Um, I took uh, two students from JDEL to, um, and that was um, an opportunity we had to go to another uh, school district's operation snowball, and uh, that was in Westmont, Illinois. Uh, we did that to kind of uh, give a chance for some of our uh, up and coming leaders. Uh, they were uh, both eighth graders who went along with us and we stayed there for two days and a night and saw some of um, some ideas that we can we can bring back looking towards a, a spring event and um, also got to see um, that I think our our students uh, really represent them the represented themselves great um, uh, the two students were Mary Bruss and Jana Black, and they will um, probably be in, involved uh, quite a bit in our upcoming opportunities for high school and middle school students going forward. And just wanted to um, publicly thank the transportation department um, for getting things together at the last minute. Um, though I had reported that I have been cleared to transport students before and have been cleared to drive <coughs> district vehicles before because I have, uh, times have changed and there are more procedures to get cleared to drive that. And I was, um, um, but they were able to quickly get me into the clinic knowing it was the night before um, I would have to leave. They were able to get my um, uh, background background check worked out in in such a way that we were meeting policy but able to do it um, do it quickly and um, able to have a uh, really good trip so um, 
that was a good good opportunity. Next we have board member school visits update. Do you have anything you want to share, Eric? Yeah, I had some changes at work, so I haven't been able to get into schools as much, but I was able to attend um, the uh, Foundations for Mental Wellness held, held their Ethics Award and was able to attend that. And uh, not only was one of our students recognized as the, the student award winner, um, but our district was recognized as the nonprofit award winner. So it was really nice. Uh, a lot of our staff was able to attend a really great video. Michelle delivered a, a wonderful speech that I thought was important for the entire room to hear. And um, so thank you for that, Michelle. And it was uh, neat to be a part of that. So, Andrew? Um, I had <coughs> visits uh, since... Our last meeting, um, I've had a chance to visit Chapel, Elmore, Fort Howard, uh, Lincoln, and Nicolay, and um, spent time in each of those buildings, uh, toured, talked with the, the principal about what's um, what's going on in those schools, and it was um, was really great to um, really great to see what's uh, what's going on there. Katie. I uh, attended part of Howe's Mindfulness Workshop that uh, was very uh, inspirational for the students and staff. And I also part or I uh, observed Aldo's Unity Day. Hmm. That was neat. The students did performances. Did you think Focus, Focus? Was that the one? Yes, Focus, Focus. focus. <laughs> the guy had a tremendous command. Oh, of these students he had there were you couldn't see how many students were in front of him and they were all just hanging on his every word and when they stood up to start doing the dance and the focus focus there were probably 150 kids there and yet he just yeah it's impressive Laura I attended I, I was at Preble um at the end of October for a late start time presentation to staff, um, which was super interesting. And only uh, only three staff members showed up, but um, a bunch of people from the task force came, and the conversation actually turned out to be really interesting. And they had a presentation, and I learned a lot about where that where that is right now. So that was good to get that update. Um, this isn't. I don't know if this is a school um, school visit or not. I attended a live, or I watched a live stream of a PTO meeting. Webster Elementary does their PTO meetings uh, live stream, and you can watch them. So I did. I watched the whole thing. It was great. Um, and then I I had a great visit at Jefferson with Kate Dolan. Um, got an update on all the great work uh, she's doing and lots of collaboration between um, Jefferson and Fort Howard already in place. Lots of plans um, for the near future, and uh, she um, she made time for me in her schedule, which was really nice. Um, and then Friday, I was at Aldo Leopold to watch uh, their presentation of Mary Poppins, which was very nice. Hmm. Rhonda? Uh, I attended the School Star Times, uh, I guess if you want to say feedback sessions at West and Preble last night, as mentioned before. Um, Edison also does or uh, live streams their um, parent meetings as well. Or at least they just started to, and I did watch one of those. Um, then I visited Dan's, Martin, and Wilder. Christina? So, yeah, I was at Southwest a couple weeks ago for the late start, which was great. Um, I was at Lincoln and, uh, uh, last month for a staff meeting. I was at Edison last week or the week before for a staff meeting. It was great. And, uh, of course, Aldo Leopold had their fall fest at the end of October, which is always fantastic. So shout out to the staff at Aldo for knocking it out of the park, actually, and the parents, too. Uh, fun side note, they always have a um, haunted house. And it is hilarious because to see these, to hear these children, it's like torture. Like they're screaming and scared and all the parents are like loving every second. It's just funny that like it's culturally acceptable to do that to our children. Um, but it was, it was 
I mean, right? Because it's like they're like little and they're scared to death and everyone's like, go in and do it. And it was great. (laughs) (laughs) There was was one one year when I was actually at the school, um, they had asked me to do all the the makeup for 32 students um, to make them look really scary and, you know, creepy. So they really got into it. I was at East for actually a couple of things. Uh, one was the I mentioned at the um, the school counselors at a week where they had every day a different theme related to <clears throat> applying to college, and uh, they were using their new community space. So it was nice to see that. But they students were allowed to come in um, any break they had for either lunch or study hall and get a pass and go in and just get some really individualized help with various aspects of the college application process. And then they unveiled their uh, mural last week at Eats Eats for East, that's their food pantry. One of the students had um, painted a mural on the wall. It was, that was nice. Um, got to meet the graduation, or the, the, yeah, oh. your, the graduation specialist who's working at East, so it was good to talk to him too. All right. Um, Next we have uh, teaching and learning, and that'll be facilitated by Katie. Thank you, Brenda. I move that the student fund. Sure. I repeat, I remove that the student fundraising activities policy 374 as presented be approved. Second. A second. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know. Andrew. Um, I just want to point out that I I appreciate what's been done on this policy. This has been one that traditionally I have voted, um, I've voted no. I've seen it as just too, these things as too damaging to student fundraising. Um, I appreciate the fact that a deeper look was taken into, into the rules where now with two food-based fundraisers being allowed per organization per year. Um, essentially, I don't see it as a problem anymore, so um, I'm comfortable with voting voting yes here. Sandy? Becker? Aye. Sitnikau? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Vanden Heuvel? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Warren? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Carried 7-0. That concludes our report. All right. Thanks, Katie. Next organizational support that will be facilitated by Andrew Becker. Okay. I move that the 2019-2020 budget transfer as presented be approved. Second. Sandy? Warren? Aye. Becker? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Sitnikau? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Vanden Heuvel? Aye. Carried 7-0. I move that the transfer of Tyson Tatro, administrative intern at Dan's Elementary, uh, to interim elementary associate principal at Dan's Elementary, as presented, be approved. Second. Sandy? Shelton? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. Vanden Heuvel? Aye. Sitnikau? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Becker? Aye. Carried 7 0. I move that the transfer of Heather Zelzer, school counselor at Franklin Middle School, to interim high school associate principal at Preble High School, 11 months, as presented, be approved. Second. Sandy? McCoy? Aye. Vanden Heuvel? Aye. Becker? Aye. Warren? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Sitnikau? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Carried 7 0. I move that the consent items as presented be approved. Second. Sandy? Sitnikau? Aye. 
Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Vandenhubel? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Becker? Aye. Carried 7-0. I uh, entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Um, oh. Yeah, that's usually just yeah, listed. The dates are just listed. Oh, was that is that the <clears throat> place where if the I mean there was is that a place where if there were agenda item suggestions they could go there? I th I thought we were gonna add that in here yeah, too, we, but we yeah. are since we are posted to talk about other board meetings. I I don't have any right this minute. Are we okay, Melissa? Okay. Which is so wait, wait even even to just have a one way a, a one way request to put something on a future agenda. Uh, okay. All right, I entertain a motion for adjournment. Oh, did I get a second? Oh, you second? Okay, all right. Okay. All, all in favor? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, we're adjourned. You have been watching the Green Bay Area Public School District's Board of Education meeting. Please visit the school district's website, www.gbaps.org, to view the program again. If you cannot fully access the information on this video, please let us know the accessibility issue you are having by calling 920 448 2025 or by email at communications at gbaps.org. We will try to provide the information to you in an alternative format and or make the necessary improvements to make the information accessible. <music>